Conversation, conversation, and sale with two fantastic, the best potters at Acoma Pueblo, Rebecca Lucario and her daughter, Amanda. This is the sixth uh, demonstration in a series of 20 that we'll be doing this month of August. That's if we all survive, I'm not so sure. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we will be um, coming live to you uh, for the next three weeks. We have lots of interesting people on our schedule. Uh, tomorrow we'll have Wilma Bacatosa from Jemez Pueblo. And this is an example of Wilma's work. Wilma does scraffito. It's an Italian word meaning to scratch. And so she makes the pot, she polishes the pot, she fires the pot. And then she goes back onto the surface with a small tool, either a dental tool or a pen knife, and scrapes off the slip. And the lighter color that you see is what has been uh, removed from the surface. Uh, so Wilma and her husband will be here tomorrow. On Thursday, we will have Sandra Victorino, from Acoma Pueblo, and her son, Cletus. You know, pottery making is a real affair. Today it's mother and daughter, tomorrow it's husband and wife, and on Thursday it is mother and son. But I hope you'll uh, tune in and join us for those programs as well. Well, I've been asked, why are we doing this? And, Indian Market this year, a celebration and sale of Native American work has been going on for almost 100 years. I mean, really close. Either this was our, their 100th anniversary or next year will be their 100th anniversary. But it brings together several thousand Native Americans from all over the, the country, and there have even been a few from Canada as well, that display their work for sale. And for so many of them, most of their income depends on the sales at that at Indian market. And for some of the, the artists, it's their only source of income. And so here we are, no Indian market, and we decided that what we would do was try and help our potters out as much as possible by having these demonstrations and conversations and sales of their work. I think um, it's, it's been really fun. The first week was really fun. We had lots of laughs and we got some really interesting comments about people um, being distracted. They couldn't stop watching and, and how much they learned. And we were really pleased and very, very satisfied by that. So during the day, we'll be talking with Amanda and Rebecca and seeing some of the pieces that they have. And of course, watching them paint these fantastic things. But uh, what I'd like to do, oh, and, and if you missed any of the ones from last week, they are on YouTube. So if you go to YouTube and search for Andrea Fisher Fine Pottery, you, all the ones from last week will be up. And, you know, if you have to step away, if you have to go to the grocery store, or pick up your child uh, from something and uh, are interrupted in seeing us today, at the end of the day, somewhere around 6 o'clock, YouTube will have this uh, one up on, uh, there, on our site there so that you'll be able to watch. Well, anyway, without further ado, I would like to introduce our new potters that are here today demonstrating and they look awfully busy so you know I'm going to have to interrupt them whether they like it or not and we have Rebecca Lucario and her daughter Amanda. Rebecca could you just you know tell us where you're from and who you are? My name is Rebecca Lucario and I'm from the Pueblo of Acoma. I've been making pottery since I was about eight years old. So that's what, 10 years total? Yes. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you have a very old child. <laughs> and um, 
I was raised by my grandparents. My grandmother, Dolores S. Sanchez, was a potter, and she's the one who taught me the art. Yeah. Great. And Amanda? Uh, <laughs> this is Amanda. Hi. Um, my name is Amanda Lacario. I'm from Aston Pueblo, Rebecca's daughter. I've been doing pottery actually probably about almost 10 years now. 10 years. Yeah. Amanda, may I ask you how old you are? I'm 35. You're 35. <laughs> so I've told everyone that you were in your 20s. And oh, that, maybe, that'll work. Yeah, I'm going to be there. Yeah, that's just the, the way you look. That's a better yeah, number. That's a better, better number for me. Yeah, it's a better number. And who taught you how to pot? Uh, my mother and my aunt. Uh, my aunt from Maryland, is, uh, Marilyn Ray, who's like really a supportive and always encouraging me when I would get frustrated, even my mom, I would get mad because, you know, I couldn't get it right away. But over time, I've developed my own style, my own technique on how to paint, so. Well, speaking, speaking of uh, aunties, um, all of Rebecca's sisters, Diane and Judy and Carolyn and Marilyn will all be here to give demonstrations uh, during the month of August, mm -hmm. and I fondly call them the Giggle Sisters because we only could do them like one at a time. Because one, once they get going, oh boy, no matter what space is there, it's just filled with laughter. And I'm afraid we would have spent the entire Telling nine million <laughs> hours just laughing our heads off. So, so one at a time. So, Rebecca, what are you doing there? Um, well, this is our paint. This is how we mix our paint. We got started a little early this morning because it is uh, time consuming to get the, the paint ready. These are the rocks. These are the, the, the kind of rocks that we use. What do you mean rocks? Um, you mean you go and get rocks? We get our rocks different places uh, at Acoma. Um, they're like um, uh, uh, iron oxide, oxide but um, the, we uh, go west of Acoma or um, along um, the um, near the, the wash where we get the rocks. Some of them are pretty small, but they make real good paint. The real small ones I've come to find out is a lot easier to crush them up. And I, it's in powder form, I put in this container. So if I add too much water to my paint, then I can use some of that to thicken the paint. Well, well let's back up just a little bit. So you go outside for a nice walk during a lovely day in New Mexico, and you see these red rocks lying on the ground, mm -hmm. and you pick them up, and you take them home, and you grind the rocks, mm -hmm. and they become the paint. They become the paint, yes. So the paint you don't buy at Home Depot in a gallon can. <laughs> no. <laughs> that would really be <laughs> nice if I could buy them, but I would have to be um, running through the, the, the where the water comes down to, to get my paints, but all our paints are natural. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't use any commercial products in our paint. I'm having trouble with this. So we also have the um, the to the black paint. We have to add. Um, okay. We have to add the the bee wheat plant, or it's called wild spinach. We call it wild spinach, and um, we boil it. The spinach is edible. So so you you go and you look for a, a wild plant that grows. And that become that wild plant becomes the black color yes. on, on your on your pot. Yes, that we add to the black paint, just uh -huh. to the black paint. But we don't always get spinach, depending on what kind of um, um, if we if it's a rainy season and we get a lot of rain, then we will get some spinach mm -hmm. and we pick it and um, we boil it and like I said, that's what, what we add to well, the Well, what part paint. of the spinach? I mean, I know we eat the leaves. The leaves. Well, you use the leaves. We no use the stems, leaves. No, no stems, no roots? No huh. stems, We use the, 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 the leaves and then um, we just um, get all the water out and then we strain it with a cloth 
and then um, we just put it on the side of the the, um, the stove in our on our kitchen um, in our kitchen, and we let it um, as much of the water as um, possible to evaporate. Once all that water evaporates, it's real um, syrupy and thick, and then it will harden. Then we put them on corn husks. Um, modern days, we use the um, the um, egg cartons. I put them in the egg cartons when it's cool. Paper or styrofoam? Mm -hmm. Paper or styrofoam? Yes. Is, which one works better? Uh, the styrofoam. The styrofoam. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Now, so, when Thomas Denario was here last week, he also uses the bee weed or bee plant or honey plant, mm -hmm. but he uses all the stems and the roots. He just yanks it out of the ground and washes it off and throws it in a pot. And um, he gets a very, very nice black color. Is your spinach slightly different at Acoma? No, it's not. You could probably do that. We, um, it's all, um, we experiment a lot with our um, how we gather our materials and how we process them. Because even um, from the different pueblos, like from Hopi, um, I learned that you can also use the, um, the from the cedar plant. You can get that and boil it and use that for the paint. Or one thing that I like that I can easily get my hands on is run to the grocery store and get some beets, just regular beets. Chop them up, boil and it. Beets? beets. Yeah. yeah. You can yeah. eat the beets and then, but you know the, it's um, it's a pretty color, but you can add it to your paint and it works just as well as the the, the wild spinach, because like I said, sometimes we, if it's a dry summer, we don't get any of it, so you have to use other. So you things. have to go to the produce department yes. and go shopping for right. your pottery materials. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Now, does it really, does it make a difference as to what time of the year you pick the spinach or what soil it it's only, in? It only grows like um, in about maybe June, June and July. Mm -hmm. So um, we go out looking for those plants and it produces like a, a purple plant, a, a flower. Uh -huh. And, uh, but we don't do the flower, we just do the leaves. So. so Already you have to be a geologist to know which kind of rocks to pick up for your red pain, and you have to be a botanist to know what <laughs> plants to use. Uh -huh. and, uh, and, you know, then there's that little thing called talent. Where do you pick that up? Uh, or does it, or is it in the water? <laughs> Well, um, to be honest, I never wanted to do pottery. You never wanted to do pottery? No. How come? Because it was hard. My grandmother made me go after all my materials. And this was when I was about maybe 10. She never let me, like I said, I started about eight, when I was eight. But I used the clay to make my pottery. It's the, oh, where did you find them? In here. Oh, okay. Um, what? Sorry, what? but she. Oh, um, tell us, tell us what your my brushes. My brushes. She found my brushes. We thought we forgot about oh. at them at home. And so, what were you painting with earlier? I was using this brush. commercial brush to fill in, which I normally do anyway. So I thought I would just fill in, but I was given this brush, but it didn't work. Oh, and did but, you try making a brush this morning? Yes, I tried making a brush with Derek's hair and it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> but here are my brushes. Um, I wrapped them up with duct tape. So this is what I'll be using to paint with. And, and they are made out of what? They duct are tape made of um, duct tape and baby hair. <laughs> Baby hair. My granddaughter's oh, my baby daughter's hair. Ball. And, um, my daughter's ball. Just kidding. Your daughter's ball. So that's what those are made of. See, everybody thinks it's just the tip of the a brush, but uh -huh. it's 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 not. It's, it's duct tape. And so, how many baby hairs are in your brushes? I have no idea. It's just the. Give me a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I'll count, I'll count the hairs. 
Well, baby hair is so fine. I mean, that's yes. what really makes it uh, really good. Mm -hmm. But anyway, when I was, um, I guess when my grandmother finally decided it was time for me to uh, do pottery, she said, well, I think you can use the real clay now. So I was real all clay. excited. Yeah. yeah the, the clay that she used to make the pottery. Uh -huh. In fact, here's the, this is the way the clay looks when it comes out of the ground. Oh, yeah? This is oh, the clay. Chunks yeah. that are really hard. Yes. And so I came to where she was making, and she said, okay, tomorrow your grandfather will take you to the clay mine, and you can get your clay. And I was like, what? Anyway, the next morning, my grandfather and I got on horseback, and we went after the clay. We went to get clay, and he said, yo, we need a little bit because it's heavy. And so I did, brought it back, and then she told me I had to, to dry, let it dry. So what, do, what does the clay mine look like? It's a very dangerous place. It's under like about six or eight feet of um, rock. And oh dear. You have to go under there. The, it's, um, it's all caved in now. It caved in several years back, over 10 years ago. And now people get the clay um, along the edge of the mesa, uh, just a few feet from the, the original place where we used to get, get our clay. But um, it's easier to get to, but it's not the real good clay. It doesn't come out in big chunks like that anymore. So it, could somebody um, take a bulldozer and just shove away all the part that collapsed so that you can continue on in that vein? No, because we have to walk to get our clay over there. <laughs> oh, we oh. carry it back in, in little backpacks or uh, wagons oh, which break down on the way. <laughs> or we, um, we just have to, uh, my, my boys, when uh, I had all of my boys back in the 80s, they um, went on horseback to bring back our clay. Wow. So that's how we were able to bring back the clay. But even then, they used to pile it at the edge of the, the mesa, and the women would go up and um, carry it back down from, from the mesa to, to, the, to the trucks. So how, how much clay now, when you go to get clay, how much would you get in a, a crack? Uh, maybe about um, three or four uh, five-gallon buckets, uh -huh. if you're lucky. But and sometimes it's just like maybe 10, um, two five-gallon buckets fill them up. But it lasts a long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, And how many times a year do you do that? Um, well, with our, our pots, you can scrape them, and then um, the, we reuse the scrapings on the pots. So mm -hmm. if we get a lot, it'll last us a year. A year? Yes. Wow. And that's for both of you? Or yes. Uh -huh. But sometimes if you get a lot... Like I said, you can get about maybe five, six, um, five gallon buckets, then it'll last longer. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we only go get the clay like maybe every three years. Uh -huh. So it just depends on the size of uh, pots that we make and of course the thickness of the, the pots that we make. And, and uh, you have to sort of time it right because you probably can't go in the winter, can you? No, no. Mm -hmm. It's usually best to do it like in maybe early May when it's not so hot because you do have to walk to get our clay. Uh -huh. And um, it's, it's really difficult to get all the, the materials together. Well, that's what sons are for, but now they are off on their own? Um, yes, most of them are off working. How, how, many, so how many sons do you have? I had three, I lost two, so I only have my oldest son, Dan. who is also a potter, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But um, it's difficult to um, gather the materials, even to get, um, people have come to ask me where I get my rocks, um, where I get my clay and my yellow slip and the white, white slip that we use to put on the pottery. So um, we, uh, we have to show them mm -hmm. where to get it yeah. because it doesn't look the way it looks. And is that what Grandpa was doing when he took you out there? Yes. To dig on that fateless day? Yes. 
And then I had, she, uh, my grandmother also told me that I had to go get my white slip. And that's another, it took all day. It took all day just to get the clay. It took all day to get the white slip. Now the white slip is different? Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. And where do you find the white slip? The white slip is in a different location, um, but um, it's uh, also difficult to get to because you also have to climb up the side of a mesa to get it. And I brought some that, um, what it looks like in the raw stage. And this is the oh, way it's really it wide, is. isn't it? Yes. Oh, so then, when you're driving along I-40 and you're looking at the mesas and they have those striations of color in them, <laughs> is that one of the striations, the, the white slip? Some you have to um, experiment with them because some of it is too chalky. It doesn't work. Uh-huh. So, um, well, and back then, to being a geologist again. Yes, uh -huh. you have to look. You have to look and to... to experiment with them and that's what my sisters and I did Marilyn Carolyn Diane and um, Judy when we would go like uh, to Arizona or went somewhere that's where we would get our paint we would gather them and experiment with them some are some are dark some are light some burn off there is no color and Amanda just found out um, she found one that um, was it's a pretty pink. It looks mm -hmm. like a, it looks pearly pink. Pearly pink. Yeah, it oh, swirls. Yeah. You know, it, you know. It's, it's almost like this color. Yeah. The yeah. And then the other one is um, was a yellow uh, um, pink, like a right? lavender. Yeah, but when they, when she fired them, it um, one was a light lavender color, and the other one Ooh. was um, a little darker. Huh. So well, I know that Carolyn and Marilyn and Judy mm -hmm. and Diane mm -hmm. um, use colors in mm -hmm. their work, but um, you guys are pretty much the standard yes. black and white mm -hmm. and terracotta. Yes, because it's hard to get some of those materials together. Yeah. And it's double work because once you paint the design, then you have to go back and reline the colored portion of the design. So um, I, don't, I don't understand what you mean. Because if you uh, if you paint the um, putting colors, it's um, it looks messy when it's um, when it's dry because it goes um, onto the black, and then you have to reline it so uh -huh. that it looks nice and neat and and even and, and yes yeah because uh, uh, I noticed that the paint doesn't stay homogenized right like homogenized milk instead mm -hmm. of it it's more like just pasteurized milk with the cream <laughs> that floats to the top so right. you're always i i notice you're constantly stirring that yes. paint mm -hmm. in there because that way mm -hmm. um it's thinner and thicker because yes. it will settle out right and it's, it's the same for all of me even the black that's why I have this big brush that i mix up the, the paint every now and then, otherwise you get some of that, um, the, the wild spinach, sometimes it separates from the, the yeah, paint. thick and thin. Yes, it gets thick. No. So that's what we do. Okay, so you've spent two days with Grandpa, and you haven't made a pot yet. No. 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 No, okay, and so then, then, so then what after, would you do? Then I had to go get my black paint. He showed me where to get them. And my um, yellow paint, and that, that was all my grandmother used, was just the black and the orange paint. So... So now, wait a minute, there's yellow paint and orange paint? Yes. Is it start out yellow and then turn orange in the firing, or...? Um, yes, different shades. You have different uh -huh. shades of yellow. Some is light, some are dark, and we have some that will um, turn a real dark, um, rusty color, and it's really pale. When, it, when you apply the paint before it's fired, then it changes in the firing. But anyway, it took about maybe a month before I was You're really, yes. <laughs> and by then I was so discouraged and that's why I said, forget it. I don't want to do this. This is too complicated. But I go, I remember those days and I'm really glad that my grandmother made me do that because now I know where to gather my, my, my materials, where they came from and why she didn't let me use her her clays and her paints right away. Well, if this tradition is to carry on, 
we need more grandfathers and grandmothers making sure that their grandchildren do that. Now, is this what you're doing with your grandkids? Yes, that's what I'm trying to teach my daughter. I have two daughters who do pottery, Amanda and Iris, she's my youngest daughter, and then my son, Daniel. He's usually the one that grinds up my clay and will bring it up to me. Now, how old is Iris now? Iris is 25. 25? Yes. Well, I knew you before Iris. <laughs> uh, I mean, Iris is sort of the benchmark. Yes. And, uh, so we know how old uh, all your kids are. Now, it does, I, I mean, Amanda looks like she does pottery almost full time because yes. of her production, but Iris, I, you know, I rarely see yes. anything that she's done. Is, is she uh, a full time potter? No. She's, um, right now, since everything is shut down, she's taking online classes. Oh. Um, she started to, um, went back to um, taking classes, she's um, taking nursing classes. Oh. But before she worked with ARCA. Um, What's that? ARCA is a program that works with uh, adults uh, with uh, disabilities. Uh -huh. And so that's where she worked right out of high school. Yeah. And um, but she went to UNM, didn't she? She went yeah. to UNM Mexico. one year, and uh, she couldn't hold a job and go to school at the same time. She found it was too difficult for her. She couldn't do it, and they work at the same time. So she just went to work, and then she didn't feel comfortable just working. So she went back to school. Yeah. She's got a year more to go. Good. Good for her. Well, this is a perfect time to do it then. Mm -hmm. So anyway, when I finally started making pottery, I, by then I was a teenager as I started. So you never learning. got, when you were eight and 10 years old, you never got to put that wet clay in your hands and- I and did, get, yeah. I did, and it was hard and I would stay with my grandmother during the uh, summer months. That's when I worked with pottery every day. And we used to have a little place right below the mesa but when I was younger, like eight, seven, eight years old, we would go up to the old 66, and we, I would go with my grandmother to go sell pottery. But um, as I got older, it was just below the mesa at Acoma, and that's where I grew up, and that's where my grandmother set her pots out on a table, and um, we sold our pottery from there. Is that the house that you live in now? Yes. Oh, uh -huh. yeah, so. Right up by the road. Yes, uh -huh. right by the road. But um, I've um, I've lived there all my life, and I've passed this work down, this art, um, to my to my children. But uh, when I was like about sixteen, I uh, was in high school, and that's when I told my grandma. She said, "You need to make pies." I said, "No, I don't want to. It's too hard. It's too time consuming. It's you know." too dangerous to go dig the clay, and it's too hard work, you know. Um, but when I was like 21, by then I had uh, 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 my son Daniel. My grandmother sat me down and she said, listen. And of course I had gone to school, I was at UNM, and she said, you can go to school, you can get your education, because you need to learn how to survive in the white man's world. But you also need to learn how to do pottery because there's no guarantee that you'll always have a job. You need to have something to fall back on. And this is a part of you, a part of us, a part of who we are. That's what she, I mean, she just sat me down and gave me the, you know, 15 minute lecture as to why I should do pottery. And of course I didn't like it I was 16 and I knew all the answers. And when I turned 21, it was worse. And I'm was like, you know, why is she still telling me this? Yeah. So, but anyway, when um, I did, and then I did realize what she meant as the years went by. I did go to school. I got my bachelor's degree in elementary education. You did? Yes. Well, no wonder you feel so comfortable teaching yeah. young kids. And then I just kept, I just kept, getting drawn back to the pottery. Yeah. 
Um, I worked at the Head Start program. I worked as a um, nursery assistant at the Parent Child Development program at ACMA when I was younger. And then I, um, like I said, I worked at Head Start and I just finally decided after I had my daughter Iris in 1993, I just decided I'm just gonna do pottery. Wow. So that's what I've been doing ever since. Wow. I did work with the language program, um, but um, that's all I do now. That's I do all pottery I do every now. day, that's my well, daily. I think we should drink a toast. Do you have your Diet Coke there? Yes. I have my Diet Coke. Let's drink a toast <laughs> to your grandma because look what she gave the world. She gave us you. And, and from anyone who's watching at home, um, if you take a look at her pieces of pottery, they are just absolutely breathtaking. And I've always teased Rebecca because... They're, someday they're going to be like the emperor's new clothes because the designs keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller and someday Rebecca's going to say well don't you see them <laughs> and there will be this plain white pot and she'll say well don't you see them but uh, it's really it's really you know wonderful that you're Grandma did that. What a gift she gave you to be yes. able to do that. I'll always cherish and, that. And she knew that you must have had a tremendous amount of, of talent because, uh, I mean, here you are going from uh, a teen, a kid, and then a teenager saying, "Man, I'm gonna do that," uh, to probably the the finest, most detailed wonderful, beautiful Akama pots that have ever been made. And, uh, you. well, you, you know, you're at, you're at the top of the, you're the leader in the class. <laughs> uh, absolutely, absolutely. Now tell me about what's happening in, in Akama. Oh, did you have something to say? No, I'm sorry. I just wanted to um, see if I could say hi to a friend oh, who lives in New York. She's, oh. uh, I told her about this. I called Derek for the info so she could um, um, join us and watch us. Um, her name is Eleanor. She lives in New York. And um, I hope she's watching. She's yeah. a very dear friend. Well, if Eleanor, <laughs> if you're on, Eleanor, go to Zoom. And then you and Rebecca can talk to each other in person. Or request for a telephone call back from our website. Yeah, yeah but with a telephone call, you guys can then, you know, speak live, and all the rest of us can snoop on, on your, your conversation. But, uh, yeah, that's great. And, you know, I should remind people at home, if you do have questions... If you're on Zoom, we will glad you, gladly put you up so you and Rebecca can talk face to face. But if you, you know, are still in your jammies or you didn't take out all those bottles of wine from the, you know, what happened at your house last night, um, you can be on YouTube and you can um, um, do a, a question in writing and we'll be happy to pass it on uh, to Rebecca. But so tell me now, uh, what is going on at Acamo Pueblo these days about grandmothers standing over their granddaughters, shaking their fingers at them, <laughs> saying, you are going to be a potter. Is that happening now? Well, we do have a lot of, um, in my opinion, I see a lot of beautiful artwork. But the only thing is a lot of them are working with um, ceramics, commercial, commercial slip cast, made. yes, yes, pots, because they do not have the rock that they need to um, mix their paint. They do not have the. Um, they don't know where to get their materials. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them are. That's that's as far as they go. Yeah. So that so is. So they just do the artistic part of it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, they don't do the really hard part. Yes. Or a lot of people are using commercial clay. 
uh, because, like I said, it's very difficult and hard work and um, time consuming to get your um, clay and um, the black. A lot of them are making the beautiful pots and everything, but they're using commercial paint, the black. And um, it's nice, it's good work, but I think that these people that are very talented with the, the way they're doing their work, I think that it would be really wonderful if they would do all their work from the natural materials that, that Akuma is known for. So the artistic, the artistic. I'm worried about what may happen. What? Do we have someone on Zoom? Yeah, we have a couple people on Zoom who are listening in. Yeah. If, if you're on Zoom, please go to the chat window when it's a good time. I will let you talk to Rebecca and Amanda. Keep going. Okay. Well, anyway, I sort of lost my train of thought. We were talking about the, <laughs> the people that are passing on the artistic part of it and the symbology part of it. Uh, as to what some of the designs mean in the culture, mm -hmm. but not the process of, of getting to the point where the artistic um, part kicks in. Mm -hmm. So, is anybody doing anything about that? Um, well, they did have, um, they, uh, in fact, Marilyn and I did a uh, pottery making class uh, last summer um, with the it was a, a graph that the Haku Museum got. I'm Did sorry, I, Amanda. It was a graph that the uh, um, Haku Museum got um, through the Chamisa Foundation. So with that money that we received, I um, set up pottery making classes for youth and adults. So we kind of and it was two sessions. Huh? Mm -hmm. It was two sessions that we did. <clears throat> the first one we did was for the youth, and then the second one was an adult class. So that was how they, they did that, her and Marilyn. Well, how did, how did you set them up? Did you have a, a special position? Oh, I was a curator assistant at the museum. So The, the museum that's on Acoma Pueblo mm -hmm. yes, Reservation. Yes, Sky City yeah. Cultural Center, yeah. So that's, um, that was part of um, my job was to set up those classes. So, so how many people live at Acoma now? Mm, lots or may not. Um, well, More or less. I, I have no idea, but where we live, the old Pueblo, not Acomita, because there is that Acoma, but then we live at the old Acoma. Uh -huh. We have other villages. There's Macardi's, Acomita, Anzac, and the Skyline area, uh, housing area, but where we live is right below the Mesa, mm -hmm. and right near the visitor center the Hako Museum. So we've lived there all our lives and there's only like about maybe eight families that live there. So it's a total of maybe 50 people yeah. that live there year round. Yeah. So, um, well, um, for those people who are tu turning, tuning in, um, you hear the word village and Pueblo and reservation all sort of used interchangeably mm -hmm. and I think you know if, if you're if you want some definitions uh, you know obviously what a, a village is a group of people that live in the same area mm -hmm. and the word Pueblo is merely a Spanish word that means village mm -hmm. but the reservation as in the case with Acoma mm -hmm. might include several villages mm -hmm. like um, uh, Rebecca Paris. mentioned but there are some Pueblos where there's only one living space. Mm -hmm. uh, and so reservation, Pueblo, and village are all the same thing. Mm -hmm. And usually reservation not only means the, the area in which people live, but it also means the, their land surrounding uh, that, those villages mm -hmm. in yeah. total. Mm -hmm. So can I talk to Amanda for a little bit? Sure because she's just so busy painting. Do you, is it difficult, Rebecca, for you to talk to me and, and paint at the same time? 
Yes. <laughs> I can't. I, so I, she's I can't not multitask. I'm she's not a multitasker. You're not a multitasker. No. Oh, okay. Well, then maybe <laughs> take away and I will just talk to your daughter. Okay. All right. Your turn. Your turn. Well, first of all, Amanda, I just want to tell you and everybody else out there, I just love your hair. <laughs> I think it's just so much fun. Thank you. Yeah. Was this, is, is this the way you always That's wear a it? That's a mom hairdo. That's a mom? That's a mom hairdo. Oh. She won't let me get ready, so I just flip it up and I'm good to go. Oh, oh you're good. To, oh, so it's not from your mom, but it is no. from... Uh, it's from you and your daughter. Yes. Now tell, tell us a little bit about your daughter. How old is she? Uh, her name is Mila. She's three years old. She's three years yes, old. Three now, how many pots has she made? <laughs> how many has she broken? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, she's how, actually. How many has she eaten? She. You know, she hasn't eaten any, so. Of all. Things so my dog Winston, my Chinese pug, he ate my pottery. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a daughter, a breaking pottery daughter, yeah. and a pottery eating dog. Exactly. Uh, that's quite a combination. <laughs> yeah. You don't stand a chance, right? Huh? Yeah. Huh. Yeah, but well, she's three. She's um, very talkative. She's a really bright kid. She's really observant and. She actually spends a lot of time with my mom at her studio and watches her paint and she'll play and she actually paint. uh, paints. She gets the ceramics is what she did, like how my mom started, you know, commercial stuff. So uh, that's what she does. She paints turtles and stuff and she... And she's three. She's three, yeah. Uh, so, um, was it this year? Was it this year for you? Was it the or was it last year for market? She was only two, so she had painted some plates. I had them on the table, and she got into them, so I just let her paint them. And um, I was telling my mom, I said, I was like sitting there and waiting for them to people to start coming through, and I looked over, and here she's the first one. And so all the some lady came by and was like, I'm gonna take all these plates, and I was like, she's under the table asleep. I'm the one. I'm gonna keep her money. <laughs> Sad. I was like, she just stole my business. <laughs> she stole your business. Well, you can only imagine how your mom must feel. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, but she's, she's been good. She's anxious to go back to school. She likes school, so it's been hard for her, but um, I just tried my best to explain to her, like, what's going on, you know, yeah, especially with the mask thing. Yeah. So, like, she had an appointment, um, last month and that was like her first time off getting off of the Pueblo so mm -hmm. um it was a shock to her to see um everybody wearing a mask and she kept asking me like mom why are they and I would kept telling her like you know there's a virus and you know people have to wear a mask you're gonna get sick so now she's like okay you wear a mask mom and like if I go to the store she'll tell me be careful be careful <laughs> and I'm like okay and yeah. her are there are there restrictions at Acoma Pueblo? Right now the Pueblo is closed. It's closed. It's, yes. Which means no one can come no in. No one can go in or out. You have to You can't you know, go out. Week. What are you doing here today? Did you sneak out? <laughs> we um there's a curfew in place uh seven days a week. It's from eight to eight to five mm -hmm. eight a, um eight PM to five AM. And then uh, there's only one way in and one way out at exit 102. There is a checkpoint. They check your ID, make sure you know you're good to go. So the children cannot come out. They won't let the children through the reservation. So wow. like I said, my daughter had an appointment. Yeah, she had an appointment, and you have to show the documentation. So that was how I was able to take her. <laughs> like I said, it was just a shock to her. Like everything just changed, and changed. yeah, she was trying to figure out. Like what was going on? Well, did you tell her they were all bank robbers? <laughs> <laughs> I told her, I was like, you know, I was like, it's just a precaution, you know. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, she's really, um, she really understands a lot. I mean, yeah. You know, as, as young as she is, it surprises me. And I'm, I'm really glad that um, she does spend a lot of time with my mom at the studio mm -hmm. because then um, my mom talks to her a lot in, in Acoma, so she hears that 
the language. language. Yes, and she's learned, you know, songs and stuff in, in ACMA, and it just, it's so neat to hear because I understand, but I don't speak it. And what, and that's yeah, what, my language, fault. what language? Karen. Karis. Karis. Yeah. And um, you don't speak it? I don't. I, I can say some words, um, but I don't really speak it. Because to me, like when I was growing up, um, I didn't really, I didn't really take an interest in learning the language. And that's what I regret now because mm -hmm. I have a daughter, you know, and I, I want her to learn. But like I said, my mom's an awesome teacher, so she's been the one. Oh, just think of all the conversations that your mom and your daughter can carry on, and yeah, you're not part of it. Uh oh. Yeah, and that's exactly what I was telling um, my mom. I was like, you, you know what? I said you can't hide anything from her because, like, you know, with the younger kids, when there's something, they, the adults talk in the language, so the kids don't really yeah. know what they speak in code. And I was like, oh, she already knows what you're saying. You might as well just say it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, there have been lots of language studies, and they said that, you know, your ability to um, learn a new language yeah. as you get older really depends on whether you've heard that language spoken when you were little. Mm -hmm. And uh, that that's a, a wonderful gift because now, you know, people who... Um, like your daughter who listened to grandma all mm -hmm. over the uh, for a long time yeah. She may have the possibility of going and learning lots of different languages mm -hmm. where people like you and me yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. we Just struggle with English right. That's that for sure <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. Your, your mom said that she uh, spent uh, her young years eight and ten mm -hmm wanting to make pots but not really wanting to do the work mm -hmm. and then uh when she and then she didn't really start she postponed the start of making pots until she was in her 20s what about you and your pottery making when did you start around the same time in my 20s yeah in your 20s but mm -hmm. did you did you uh I, I stuff when you were eight or ten. When I was younger, yes, I remember. You know, my mom would let me paint the ceramic pieces, and I would make like little bowls and stuff to sell uh, along her side her artwork at like the shows she did, market and stuff. Uh, but I never really actually took an interest in it either. I I would get frustrated because with like with her, she would do the same thing like kind of like you need to do this, you need to learn this, and I I didn't want to. I was like, so <laughs> I, I would get frustrated because she was always harping on me. And the same thing, like her grandma, my great grandma told her, she told me, you know, you need to have another source of income. You're not, you know, there, there's no guarantee that you'll always have a job, you know? So as I got older, I finally realized like that it's not just making and painting pottery. Like there's, you put a lot of effort, like you're, Literally, your blood, sweat, and tears go into making each piece, and you know. And for me, it's like my comfort zone. Like I can sit there and paint and forget about all the madness in the world, or forget about I had a bad day. I can sit there and paint, and it's just like draws me and makes me content. So. And all the rest of the world goes away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! Yeah. I wish we could. I wish that could happen to me. <laughs> Otherwise, I turn on the television and and sometimes yell at the television. <laughs> yeah, and uh, recently uh, my daughter and I, we actually um, moved back up to on top of the Mesa. You so, did? Yeah, I mean, oh. my daughter, and she loves it. She loves it there. She, we go back down below to oh, the, to the house knows. with the electricity and stuff, and she'd rather be outside. Well, and she's bugging me. She's like, Mom, can we go back up? Can we go home? <laughs> so it, it's, you know, she's adapted to everything pretty good. Well, let, let's talk about that Mesa a little bit. Um, that was the original home of the Akama people, mm -hmm. if, if I'm correct. Yes. And the Mesa at uh, Akama Pueblo is 
How, how, how many feet in elevation is it from the floor of the valley? Uh, it's about 365 feet. 301 foot for every day of the year. Right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the village was, was built on the top of this mesa. Mm -hmm. And it uh, has spectacular views, by the way. But more than likely, it was a lava tube. Do you think that that all the, the rest of the wind blew everything else away? Mm -hmm. And the village was built on, on the top. And uh, at one time, how many families do you think lived up there? Lots, huh? Um, yeah, from what my mom's told me, like, yeah, there was a pretty huge amount of people that live on there. And yeah. it, it, to me, that's mind boggling because it's like, you look at that mesa, you're like, how are all these people fit on there? <laughs> you know? I'm like, oh my goodness. Yeah. And I see old pictures and stuff, and it, it, I, I don't know, I, I, it just mind boggles me on how they were able to do all that. Well, the village, is, I mean, the village on the mesa is gorgeous. Yeah. And there's only a couple little drawbacks, like there's no electricity, mm -hmm. no gas. Yeah. No running water, <laughs> yeah. no no bathrooms. Yeah. Uh, it's quite a challenge to live there yeah. today. I mean, when in the old days nobody had any of those things, and yeah. so it really didn't matter. But now, uh, it's you spend a great part of yeah. your day just taking care of those conveniences. Yeah. Do we have a question? We, we don't have a question, we have a message. The message is, is hello to both Rebecca and Amanda. I have a beautiful plate by Rebecca and lovely polychrome jar by Amanda, both purchased here in Santa Fe. Wish we were there. And this is from Kurt in New York. Oh, Kurt. Kurt. Yep. And Kurt. <laughs> Oh, wow. Kurt was the merchandise manager wow. of, well, hello, of, of Macy's. <laughs> yeah, hello, Kurt. Oh, Hi. Yay. Wish you were here. Yeah, we all wish you were here, Kurt. Thanks. <laughs> uh, and so now, how many families live on the Mesa? Um, roughly about, I would say less than 10. Less than 10. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the people that do live up on the Mesa, are they just there because they like it better or they have no place to go or they perform maybe religious ceremonies? There are fam the families up there that are um, have to do with the religious part of our culture. You know, yeah. Families do visit right there the, the full year. And then there are some, like myself and my daughter, you know, it's crowded at the house, so, you know, we have the other house, so we moved up there. Yeah. And then there... And so you may live below the mesa where you have, as Rebecca told me this morning, hallelujah, a washer and a dryer. <laughs> yes. uh, but uh, you, you still have family housing on the top of the, the mesa. Yes, yeah, the family home. And, like I said, that's where yeah. Yeah. And, and you use that family home when there are religious yeah. activities going on. Yes. And feast days, you know, they come up with September 2nd, all that, they come up, and that's like the biggest feast day we have. Now that's your feast day, day on September yes. 2nd. Is that going to happen? Oh, uh, no. Everything no. basically for the year. Um, for the year. So over. all the way yeah. to the end of the year. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Amanda, we can continue this conversation, but... You know, if you want to stretch your legs a little, maybe you could go with Derek over to the pieces sure. uh, that you've made and talk a little bit about them. All right, that okay. works. Okay. Yeah, okay. great. And give Rebecca some peace and quiet so that she, <laughs> she can paint. I'm probably making her nervous. <laughs> Well, I, you know, it's really fascinating to watch Rebecca paint, and uh, but you know maybe Amanda can fill you in a little bit on uh, some of the work that she does as well. And if you'll notice that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, or as some people say, the nut doesn't fall <laughs> far from the tree. So I'm over here in the display. 
with Amanda, and we have a bunch of Amanda's pieces here, and Amanda, if you'd like to tell me about any of them, um, grab them and tell me about them. <coughs> This one actually was the one my mother was talking about, the pink, the pink paint. Uh, so it actually turned like a lighter color. The, this one was actually like a purple and then it fired light. So it was, I, surprised me, I thought it was gonna actually be darker, but it didn't, so. That was. So Amanda, where do you get the ideas for your designs? Um, just from watching my mom, a lot of it is, um, I just like to try different styles, different, like incorporate different patterns into it instead of just all one pattern. As you can tell, like I do some of the lines and I try to change it up. Once in a while, they're all different color. Like I said, I wanted to see what those, that piece would fire, what color. So I mainly stick to black and orange though, because like I said, it, time consuming to reline. Um, I actually did something different with this. Um, I was actually painting this and I was going to put a more intricate design on the outside, but then I just had this idea pop into my head with the dancers there. And to me, I was just like, this is like the whole, like how the whole world is just in chaos right now, but this north star pattern there and then you got your feathers in there that represent protection and i'm like hey they're just you know trying to keep the world safe and keep the world upheld so that's kind of like how i got this design so that was pretty cool yeah. simple <laughs> what, what are your favorite designs to paint my favorite designs to paint are the checker patterns these cornfield patterns here and the snowflake pattern so but like I said, I do try to change it up a little bit. Um, this one actually just basically has the lines that represent the rain, and then you got your snowflake pattern in there. And then you, this checker pattern here represents cornfields, and you got your black in there for the uh, clouds. So that's what that one is. Yeah, well, uh, so lots of corn, right? You use corn for all sorts of things. We use corn for all, yes. And corn. does many of you people farm in the Yakima region? Uh, yes, right now there, um, a lot of the crops are, are being planted and everybody has their fields where the irrigation water and everything goes through. So, um, yeah, we started that. And... Yeah, so why don't you tell actually, me about some other pieces and like what's yeah. your favorite shape to make and... Um, plates are easy for me to paint. They're easy to hold and paint, you know, on my lap or on the table. Uh, the favorite pieces I like to make are vases, these shapes, because they always come out different. They're never the same. So, it, you know, you're always going to get a different shape no matter how you try to... And it's weird because they all shape to your hands, so this you put your hand in it like that so it's all like my hand fits perfectly because it's shaped the way to my fingers so that's how these these are built up <laughs> and what's your favorite part about pottery making is it the coiling is it the painting is it the uh, collecting the materials is it the end product well, at the end it's the painting because uh, like i said earlier uh, it's like my piece you know like i I can sit there and focus and like forget about everything that's going on and just zoom in on that and just paint away. Um, it's oh. Yeah, uh, give me one second, I'm gonna grab Andrea. Okay. Amanda, tell us a little bit about these pieces that are sort of flat um, and they look like they have a hole in the center of them. Yeah, some of them, some of my pieces do have a hole in the center. I can never really actually find the center. <laughs> so a lot of my pieces have holes on the sides. I just started doing that. So there's a hole in the side. Um, but like I said, this one, I actually kind of, I think it's the center, <laughs> got the center. And these are actually uh, seed pots. 
So um, they're just a more modern version of what um, the men used to use in the, in the fields and they would use them to store seeds. So of course back then the pots were, the seed pots were bigger in shape and they had a large hole. And um, it was just to keep the rodents out. They would use corn cobs or you know a piece of wood to close it. And then during planting season, it was just basically like a salt shaker. You go through the field and get those seeds out. You know, yeah, it makes it easy to plant and yeah. make sure no <laughs> yeah. mice eat it yeah, over, exactly. the, over the winter time. Yeah. But um, you don't put seeds in there now, do no, you? No, no. Like I said, this is just more a more modern version of what, you know, how, how times have changed. But, but why is the there style. a hole now? Uh, you have to put a hole in it because if not, when you fire it, it'll, the pressure, it'll pop. So the air on the inside yes. heats faster yes. than the the air uh, than the clay body, mm -hmm. and it's I, I think it's kind of the way popcorn works, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, but that's why there has to be a hole in, and you have to make sure the hole is clear through, like I said, otherwise it will pop on you. I've had you know some mishaps like that, and it took me a while to actually get the hang of making an actual vase and jar because I always, always, always used to scrape them too much and I would put holes in them <laughs> and I used to get so frustrated <laughs> or I wouldn't pack the clay and I would get air bubbles and they would like literally a whole chunk would blow off and I would get so upset and I would be crying. <laughs> it was, it was horrible when I first started but well, I, it didn't make me want to give up. It just made it, me want to perfect more and try something different and so I finally figured out my own style and how to get that clay and get the air bubbles out and everything so I still have mishaps here and there but not as not quite as often anymore so that's a good part yeah well I can understand why you might cry over that because yeah. <laughs> you dug the clay you cleaned the clay you 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 found the right rocks for the paint. Mm -hmm. You you took got the white slip. Um, you had to prepare all these materials. Then you had to make the pot by the coil method because none of these pots are are wheel thrown or slip cast. They're all mm -hmm. made by rolling out worms of clay and stacking them on yes. top of each other. Mm -hmm. And you did all the painting and then you put it in the fire and it's completely destroyed. Mm -hmm. And there's not a darn thing you nope. can do to, <laughs> to fix yeah. it. And uh, that I'm sure that all that labor uh, is something that, you know, yeah. But, you know, it's part of the deal, though. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's sort of the way it goes. And, you know, when you look at the prices of things and you realize how much labor is involved in, yeah. in doing this, uh, they yes, become, exactly. yeah, they become really very reasonable in, in, their, in their prices, things mm -hmm. that are handmade. Mm -hmm. And we can't forget that, you know, this is Rebecca and Amanda's um, Indian market and that all the pieces that we have here are for sale and they are all um, and and the artists both Amanda and Rebecca will benefit from the sale of these pieces well I think we're losing that one <laughs> 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 anyway, um, and uh, yeah, so. the, all of these these five pedestals here are all your work. Yes, and we can see the the similarities mm -hmm. uh, in design work with yours and your mom's. Is there something that you do that uh, is that you could like call your own? I try to do. Um like incorporate the lines type in, into the design instead of just having one design. Oh, I've tried that. I'm actually starting to use a little more color. So um, that's... Um, and you're something. using a little more color yeah, in your I pieces? Yeah, I try to do um, like, like I did here, you know, these, just something different to kind of make it stand out more. Um, or like here, you know, I, like I said, I'm just trying different ways of how to um, incorporate designs. And now, do, do those lines have any meaning? Lines always represent rain. 
green. Yes. So you should be painting lines all over everything. Yes, it's exactly. dry as a bone here this year. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the uh -huh. lines always represent rain. And then you always got, um, let's see, where is it? You got the North Star pattern in there that, um, oh, I actually took it. Yeah, he so. took it. <laughs> I'm like, well, that one's gone. Yeah, the North Star pattern, or you got your, you know, there's, there's feather patterns in there. So they all, all the designs have meaning, have a particular. So, um, if for those of you do, who don't know this out there, that plates are the hardest shape to make. So I've been told because they crack and they warp very, very easily. So, uh, you know, you might think, oh, they're sort of flat, that, that they might be easier to do, but they, um, when they dry, they like to split on the edges. Yes. When they, uh, when the drying process is over, they don't sit flat at all. They just wobble along like something you might see as an exercise thing at the gym. Uh, and uh, and then when they're fired, they do both of those things, crack and wobble, uh, in the firing process. And so, you know, all of this is really, really, uh, a really time-consuming, difficult uh, thing to do. And out of all the pieces of yours that are there, Amanda, which one is your favorite? My favorite is probably the plate. So the plate? The big one, yeah. I actually had a lot of fun thinking that, even though it drove me crazy. <laughs> I, I had a lot of fun doing that. Well, when when you start to paint, where do you start in the middle? Or I always start, start in the middle, yeah, and then you I work start in the way middle out. and work to the end. Yes. Well, what happens yeah. if it's like the plan ahead sign? Well, well, like I said, it's easier for me to just kind of start in the middle and then I work my way out. I'll do the lines first and then I'll go from there. Um, I just have to try to make sure that they're even. Well, do you, make, do you measure it to find the middle? Um, I'll, I'll use a paper or a compass or something and I'll just try to um, turn it like that four times. And then from there, that's, I'm like, okay, that's my center. And then I go from there. And then you just go from <laughs> and there. I just you go just from start there. painting the mm -hmm. lines. Do you yeah. draw it on first? Um, I actually use a pencil because the pencil will burn off in the fire ring. So I use a pencil and I kind of draw like a graph paper basically on this. And then from there, it's just like a blank sheet. It's just whatever's in my mind, whatever I envision seeing, then that's what I'm going to do. And well, so, well. like I said, yeah, I try to see it's not all the same pattern. There's a different pattern right there. And there's four of them. So I try to make it a little different every, every time. <laughs> Well, what I think is really remarkable is that uh, if you look at these pieces from far away, they look gray, <laughs> but they're not gray. They're black yeah. and they're, they're white. They're black and white. It's black on white. Yeah, and then the, I always sign them with, of course, my first in, uh, initial of my name, last name, where I'm from, and then my um, mark is the corn. So that's how. You're able to tell my work from my mother's. Wow. Yeah. It's really, really gorgeous. And you're getting just as good as your mom, too. <laughs> yeah. She's got to watch out. Uh -oh, uh -oh. There's I'm someone trying. Fighting, I'm fighting in her heels. Huh? Yeah. There she is sitting at the top of Acoma Pub while as far as Potter's going there. And her own daughter, her own daughter is fighting in her heels. A few more years of perfection, I'll uh, get there. <laughs> uh -huh. Now, you know, if you go on our website, you can see all the pieces that uh, Amanda and Rebecca have for sale. Um, first, you go to our homepage, and then you click on Artists, and then they'll, you'll see a little boxes with letters. Um, look for Lucario. Click on the L, and then you can scroll down through the L's, and Amanda's up there near the top, and Rebecca, of course, is much further down. And once you get to the, the place where you can see all their pots, they start in descending order of price. So the most expensive one as, is at the top, and you as you scroll down, they go down to the one that's the least expensive one. And 
you will then get uh, a little description and you'll get the exact measurements and the prices of, of all of their pieces. Well, do you want to go back to work? And I'll talk to your mom because I can <laughs> okay. hear I can hear her over there doing something. And I want to know what she's up to. She's painting. She's hard at work painting. Thank you. So, um, what's up to Rebecca? Oh, nothing. Oh, Just nothing. Painting. <laughs> Just painting. Well, I heard some grinding noises over here. What were you doing? I was mixing up the paint. I noticed it was still kind of gritty from the um, the, uh, the powder uh, paint that I put in there. So I was. Um, grinding it up so it would be a lot smoother. It doesn't make a difference? Does it still stick? If it's It still sticks, but if there's a big piece in there, it'll come off after the firing. Oh, so, oh, so it, it will flake off? Mm -hmm. So oh, that's why I have this rag here too. If it's too much, then I use this rag and I strain my paint. I oh. strain it so that it's smoother in there. Oh. So that's huh. where it I looks this like it's for. been used more than once. Oh yeah, <laughs> you can see all that in there, things that come out of it that shouldn't be in the paint. But oh, I just I can't put the sticker on her sponge. What is she? Can I on her? Just a moment. The water. So, if you're speaking to your daughter. Mm -hmm. In character. Yes, she understands, but like she um, mentioned, she doesn't really speak it. So what did you say to her? I told her it's a little gritty. You might need to strain it so that it's a smoother paint. Aha. Uh -huh. So that's what she's going to do. She's going to strain the paint and make sure that it's nice and smooth. So what's in that bottle that you were pouring in? Which one? The plastic one. Oh, that's the paint. That's the ground up... Um, the black paint that's right there. Huh. And that's why it's still, um, it's not um, that fine. Because I, um, I have um, the paint that I uh, mix, uh, crush them on. It's separate from the, the rock that I use to grind my uh, my clay. Whoa. But, um, scared me. <laughs> yeah, it scared me too. I saw that, that plate wobbling. <laughs> Well, well, Amanda was talking about her pots. Rebecca held up her favorite tool uh, to show me and told me that it was it was was like gold. So, what do you do with this tool that's like gold? <laughs> well, I like to chew tobacco. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I use these skull lids or the good old corned beef lids. That's what I use to scrape off the excess clay. Um, that's how we thin out our pots. Um, we just, when it's um, hard enough to handle, then we use the school lids and we just scrape off the clay. When it's still damp, this is dry. Yeah. Um, but I didn't uh, bring any of the, the um, clay that's already ready to make pots with, but this is what I used to scrape off the, the and, um, and that's fine, Rebecca, because in the other, um, demonstrations that we had several people made pots mm -hmm. and um, some people who did thick coils and other people who did really skinny coils and they showed that whole process but you guys are such masters at painting that I'm really glad that we're going to spend the day watching you to paint and you know when you see how long it takes 
to, to paint a piece of pottery and what you need to go through to do it. It's just absolutely remarkable. And when did your design start getting smaller and smaller? <laughs> when I started any... out doing traditional designs, I would do the parrot design and the old designs that um, you see, um, that's what Akamo is known for, those kind of patterns, those kind of designs. They do the parrot design that was introduced when the Spaniards came. And then you have your, um, they have, we had uh, a lot of the people painted uh, flower patterns and different kind of bird patterns on their pots. And a lot of the old pots and the real large pots that were made, they were mostly for personal use. They were used uh, for um, storage to put their um, the ground up um, corn or um, just whole kernels of corn or they would use them to store food in them and a lot of the bean pots were used to cook beans and other other um, uh, stews in those pots they hold water but of course those are they're not painted they're just plain um, orange bean pots and they're polished on the inside so that the food doesn't stick uh, to the uh, to the pot and uh, some are still used to make parched corn. You put sand in there and then you put your corn in there and put it over some charcoal and roast your corn and then dump it out on a screen to separate the sand um, uh, from the corn. And then you, uh, you Is that for pasole or for chicos? No, oh. it's just um, just the uh, roasted corn, the, the, I mean the um, uh, dry corn dry corn and then it's roasted with sand. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Parched corn. They call that parched corn. Just, well, do you have to get all the sand out or, you yes, know, by you the time to. you're 90 years old, you don't have any sand. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right? Yes. Yeah, they've been all just grown down. The screen and then um, just sift it and just get the <laughs> corn out. And then when they're still warm, they used to get a corn cup and uh, have some salt water ready and then just stir the um, corn up with it and then they get salty. Uh-huh. And that's what we ate when we sat around the, the uh, fireplace when I was growing up. Sort of like cheetahs, huh? Yeah, we <laughs> sat around and we told, they told us stories during oh. the winter time. Uh -huh. They would tell us stories. Now, is the curious language written down anywhere? No, it's not no. really a written language. It's just, it just passed from generation mm -hmm. to generation. Yes, they have started writing some of it, um, but... Um, it's, it's difficult to read if you mm -hmm. don't um, know how to read what's written. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All these little signs and everything on the, on the, the letters. And it was the, it's the elders, the grandparents that tell the stories? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that's interesting is that Rebecca has two sisters, Marilyn and Judy, and they both make storytellers. And I'm sure that you might be familiar with storytellers, and and maybe someone can grab me a storyteller so that I can show people what I'm talking about. But in the meantime, I can tell you that first of all, they're not dolls. They're not storyteller dolls. They are not toys to play with. What storytellers are um, is that they are. And they are sort of like an effigy. This is so the symbol of grandparents teaching their grandchildren how to uh, make pottery, how to um, the, the stories of um, their culture, the history of their culture, and uh, they are really quite wonderful and delightful and. Maybe I can pass the storyteller over to you. Oh, you can bring a camera? Yep. And also, uh, we have another message from Kurt, another question. And the question is, uh, how long does it take you, or days or hours, to paint a 12-inch plate? Days. <laughs> weeks, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sometimes it's weeks. Well, this is what we were talking about. And this is one of Rebecca's sisters, storytellers. It is um, a grandma 
with all of her grandkids. And Marilyn does fantastic storytellers. And if you notice all the detail, the little bird that's sitting on this one's head and the ladybug that's climbing on the pot. One of Marilyn's trademarks is that her storyteller always has a piece of pottery in her hand. And then of course the kids are all like kids do in every culture, climbing all over everything. And um, her mouth is open because she's either singing or speaking the words of her native language to tell the kids all about uh, um, their, the history of their people. Anyway, they, and they, they're all, you know, if you look at the back, they're all just really beautiful, beautifully done with lots and lots of attention to detail. Uh, but anyway, we'll have Marilyn almost right at the end of the month. And so uh, take a look on our website and you will see the full schedule plus Carolyn Concho, which is a week from Thursday and a week from Tuesday. Well, anyway, I don't have it all memorized, so you can just look it up on our website. But this is one of Marilyn's storytellers. And um, Rebecca, maybe what you would like to do is come over and talk a little bit about some of your pieces, okay. if that's possible. Do you want? In the meantime, what we will do is we will have uh, Amanda continue painting because she's got to get that thing done. <laughs> and it takes, it just takes so long to do. Anyway, Kurt, if you have any more questions, let us know. It's, I'm so glad to hear from you. I hope Rob is doing well and I hope Rob is retired and that you guys are, you know, living the high life in New York now that you guys can open and mm -hmm. go to restaurants and do all kinds of good things that we can't do yet, but we will. So in the meantime, we will uh, we'll just watch Amanda do a little bit of painting while Rebecca talks about some of her pieces. Well, if you look at all of Rebecca's pieces, there's one piece that stands out like you would not believe, and that is an enormous, enormous, absolutely enormous plate that Rebecca did. How long, this one's on the secondary market. How long ago did you make that plate, Rebecca? I don't even remember. I am presently making a uh, painting one and um, it's just time consuming. So I, and I was afraid to bring it in the raw stage, so I didn't even bring it. But I will probably bring it up here or um, yeah. to, to Good. show. Good, we would but, like, yeah, we'd love to see it. But, um, um, but, you know, Kurt asked the question earlier, how long does it take you to paint a plate? Mm -hmm. Can you give us an idea how long this might have taken for you to do? Just the painting itself, I Just believe, it took, took about two weeks. Two weeks, all yes. day, every uh -huh. day. Yes, all day. It's every not day. so. It's it, the the part that takes the longest are the ones that are way right there in the towards the center. Uh -huh. The outside part is it, it it doesn't take that long, but it it takes a lot of time, and then to make it. To make it um, took about maybe a week because you can um, you have to make sure the clay is packed. Then you have to pat it out really um, thin, and then I use um, I use like a big doll rod, and I'll press the clay out for the pieces that huge. And once I and, and get it flattened out, then I'll get something round to use and then I'll cut it out but that doesn't guarantee so you, that yeah. it's going to come out and stay and keep that shape because the clay when it dries some places it'll come in or it'll work yeah uh -huh. and then if you turn it upside down then it caves in 
so you it pit plates are difficult to make yeah that's what I so, you know, we were talking about a little bit earlier that yes pit plates are probably the most difficult uh, shape to make because of the fact that they warp and they crack so easily mm -hmm. they do now how, you do you, where do you start them the edge or in the center um, it's better to start from the center and work out. Why is it better? Uh, why is um, it better? Because you can um, you can use like um, a piece of paper, something round, and try to find the center. Uh -huh. Or like I said, even though you can find the center when it's still wet, but when it dries, you try to mark it. It's it, it loses its shape. <laughs> so you really you have to work with the shape that you have. Mm -hmm. So you start in the middle, and then you can at least, I usually do it in fourths first. You can get a string or something and mark it okay here and there, and then go across. But then, like I said, it, it's the, the shape is what you have to work with, so you kind of have to adjust it. So even like with this, even if you've got something here, it's not going to be straight all the way down. It sure looks like it. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to, to make adjustments. And then you'll also, the other way, you're going to find out that it's not even. It's because some of these are not all even. They're not all even. They're not this, Like this one here is compared to this one. So it's you just have to work with it. And then you can draw a line around so that you at least have some kind of... Um, uh, guide so that you know where to start uh, painting and it's all like in, in rolls yeah so that's how we work with that a long time ago my grandmother used to use charcoal she used charcoal she would just section it off in fourths and then just keep breaking it down wow until she got the uh the pattern down well you know that's the beauty of the handmade the, that um the, the shapes that are within it are slightly different from each other from from sort of stripe to stripe now i've had people say to me oh sh that's impossible she had a computer generated <laughs> do you oh have do you goodness. have a computer if i no not where no, i live, not where you live. <laughs> you don't have a computer. I'm, I'm having a difficult time just learning how to use my phone <laughs> i just got me a phone and it is to me, it's complicated because I don't. I, I'm. I'm really not that up to date with all this. The modern technology. Um, so when I was someone, learning how to do the zoom and everything, yeah. I couldn't even do that. Well, when someone says, uh, "Is the computer generated?" I can just have a resounding <laughs> no, no, no. no. You no. have a whole shop full of my pots if, if, if I did have a work, work with oh, a computer. <laughs> and uh, you and Amanda are so <laughs> ambitious and you spend, uh, you know, countless hours doing this. And one thing that's really interesting about, that I find is interesting about this plate is that if you, if you start staring at it, you begin to see all kinds of interesting things like the lines, they, they go in one direction around the plate, curved around the plate, and then if, if you sort of readjust your eyes, they go in the other direction, <laughs> and then you see concentric circles from the center that start small in the center and get bigger and bigger until finally it's the edge of the plate itself. And then if you, <laughs> you look at the, the plate you know, from a slight angle, you see straight lines that go right straight to the center, which are <laughs> the center of these design elements. I mean, you could sit there and watch that plate. I think it would be much more entertaining than watching television, that's for sure. But, uh, and the reason that I pointed this plate first, because I believe that this is one of uh, Rebecca's masterpieces. I mean, how many of uh, uh, acne pots that are this large and the, so precise and so tiny in their designs. How many exist? I mean, this may be the only one. <laughs> and uh, it's 
depending on you know the next large one that you're doing, whether it's going to successfully um, come out of the fire. How how how? I think this is 24, 24, 25 inches in diameter. Um, the one that I'm I don't think is quite that large. I think it's 22. Yeah. One, once it um, dries, it's going to shrink. So it's it might be about 22. And, and then it will shrink a little bit mm -hmm. more in the firing. In the firing, too. yes. Uh -huh. I do, most of my firing um, is done in, in an electric kiln. But, um, and I started doing that back in. Um, Oh, I guess the late 80s. Before that, I was doing strict outdoor firing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nothing but outdoor and firing. we still see some of your outdoor yes. fire yes, I pieces do. now. And if I'm going to enter a piece like for um, for the Indian market or one of the um, judging, um, for, for judging in any of the, the shows, then, then I will um, fire outdoors. But... Um, it's with the kind of work, the pattern, the designs that I put on my pots, I get less breakage in an electric kiln. Yeah. Outdoor firing. And you don't is, get any fire clouds. No, but, and you also, you will still get mishaps in the firing, <laughs> in the electric, because there could be a foreign object in there, or you could have an um, air bubble in there, and they will break, and it will ruin your whole firing, because it will that it'll just pop in the in the kiln. So, um, but it's um, I get a lot of pots from the um, the kiln, and sometimes I'll do a double fire, which means I'll use a, a low temperature cone fire and then refire outdoors. Uh -huh. But sometimes even then, because like I said, <coughs> outdoor fire is not a controlled temperature. So the fire comes in, and even if I pre-shrunk the, the pots in the firing, they will still pop outdoors. Wow. Well, you know, also, I think Alchema has turned to a lot of kiln firing, not only because the kiln firing has, is not as precarious and not as dangerous mm -hmm. and, and gives you more results mm -hmm. rather than fewer results. And... Uh, uh, also, the buying public has a little something to say about that, too, because if, for example, this big this plate or one of these pieces over here had sort of a light gray area mm -hmm. where the flames or the smoke mm -hmm. could have hit the pot, it will, it will, it will, put some, it will lay down um, a, a, a thin film of coloration that you can't remove. Uh, no matter how hard you try to mm -hmm. scrub it off. And mm -hmm. the buying public looks at that as a mistake rather than part of the mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you're doing such intricate work, um, it, it sort of takes away from the, the design that, that you've done. And so kiln firing makes a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. But as long as that technique of um, outdoor firing never leaves uh, or that someone still knows how to do it, um, that's, that's really, really good. Mm -hmm. But uh, all of these pieces are wonderful. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you tell us a little bit about this shape? Um, well, the, these, this shape here the oil shape is used for, um, like, uh, for carrying water, and we still use it for um, uh, our drinking water. It keeps it cool, so we use um, a lot of that, and then we um, have uh, pots that are, are just bowls that we also still use um, to serve our food in. Mm -hmm. But like I said, they're polished on the inside, these are not polished on the inside. And we don't use these for, um, um, you, you can't really use these for, for putting water in them because of the alkali in the water, it will ruin the pot. 
Yeah. So well, it's just, you know, for display. It's not. Um, that's used something for... that I want everybody mm -hmm. out yes. there to make mm -hmm. sure of that you never, never, ever, ever, ever put water yes. in, a, uh -huh. in a Native American right. piece of mm -hmm. pottery because they're not like a coffee cup. They don't yes. have any glaze uh -huh. on them. Right. And so consequently, they're not waterproof. And what happens is when Rebecca said that it keeps the water cool, and that's because the water is continually passing through the pot and, um, and evaporating. And when evaporation takes place, it needs heat to do that. And what happens is the contents cool. And so in the old days, it was, you know, um, a way of getting a cool drink of water, almost like a little bit of re refrigeration. Mm -hmm. But now, I mean, these are incredible works of art. And if, <laughs> if you put water in it, eventually it's going to be destroyed. And also, it may destroy your furniture that's, that you have it sitting on as and, well. And I have heard that some people will actually put potting soil in there too for a plant, so that is not recommended. Well, no, that's, no, that's not recommended. Well, you know, if you have all the money in the world, uh, but, you know, people at Acoma can put use these for plants and they can use them for water because they can make another one. But you have to lay out a few dollars right. in order to purchase another one if you destroy it. So, you know, I can't say it often enough. Never, ever, 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 never, ever put water inside okay. of an American This Indian one pot. here, I don't know if you noticed, it's kind of a, a, a beige uh, color. This was fire outdoors. That plate? Because it's a higher temperature and that's how um, it will, um, the, the white is not as white. It kind of, um, it's, um, if the fire is too hot, then it will change the color on it. And sometimes if it's really hot, the black will get shiny. Ooh. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, and, but the shards go to the outside of the pot and you can feel the, the roughness on it huh. if it's over fire. Wow. And so you're talking about the one with the really big, yes, the that's really a, big design, right? Compared that's to a, the other ones, yeah, <laughs> yes. That's that, a big I, I saw the, uh, it, it's called a rug pattern. I saw that on a rug, and I just got an idea from that, and I put it on there. Yeah, where where do you get all your ideas? Um, some, like I said, are from rocks um, that that you see at at home. How they, I just look at the rocks, and sometimes you see almost like a pattern. And I get my ideas from that, and some of it is just, I just came up with some of these designs. Now, a lot, I give my, um, I got my ideas where I got started painting this design here that people call the snowflake pattern, where it's from the late Dorothy Teribio. Um, She painted, um, she used to paint her pots like some of the pots that are in here. And that's where, but I don't like to, copy people's work or duplicate other people's work. So I just started coming up with my own patterns, my own designs, and then I just made them smaller and smaller, and this is what I came up with. Well, do you know what Dorothy, <laughs> what Dorothy told me once? She said that some of the designs that she invented, if she painted them for more than two hours, they made her sick, and she went into the bathroom and threw, would throw up because she was so dizzy from painting her own designs. And so it was two hours at a crack for painting pots for her, not anymore. Now tell me about these pots, because you know, I don't see Amanda doing anything quite like it. Here's one. Oh, yes. Okay, these are called members figures, members designs. I like to mostly paint the fish and the different birds and um, some are the turtles. So that's what I paint on some of my, uh, my pots. And some you can feel sometimes the, the clay will dry, the pots will dry on me. So some of them are heavy. You can feel the, the um, the weight of the, these pots. But if I scrape it too much, then it'll crack. So um, you have to make sure you make just enough that you can handle to if finish, you, to, to finish you, the work. If you scrape it too much, you wind up with a hole and then one of those right. fish can get away. <laughs> uh -huh. 
but uh, I noticed that your uh, so you paint the fish on first and that particular one yes and then you do all do the those lines, lines yes. that line mm -hmm. work and tell yes. me what what are the lines the lines right on it represent rain but this white through here that represents the lightning pattern so those fish are happy swimming on that right because they're in water <laughs> effectively but remember don't put any water in these pots yeah and this is an old design that i remember the the elders in the village painted like lucy lewis uh, my grandmother and they would um they called this uh pattern samomoka is what they used to call Would you it. say that again samomoka which means? Which means it's like um, it makes your eyes go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so that's what they used to call that pattern. But um, a lot of that, um, you, Lots I don't of know. Lines. Yes, and then it, you could see like the, the, a star pattern or um, I don't know. Some people say they can see the um, um, a snowflake or something. I guess it's all, you just use your imagination. But um, there's some that there was a, a, a um, elderly person at the pueblo who told me on this pot here, that pot there that the her their snow pattern or design, it's it's got the design but it's white. She said that that was the lifeline of a pot if you paint it one like that. Like and then the one other that's people, on other the, people, yeah, will say the something that they have the um yes. So that line that you see coming yes. now, yes. coming around, it's is the, the lifeline. Line. Yes, that's what uh -huh. I was told. Yes. Now, um, we with some of the other potters that we have um, had demonstrations from, they put a break in the um, oh at the, the top on the on the top mm -hmm. and the rim. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't see any breaks in mm -hmm. your pieces. Is it? No. Um, it's just so that um, most uh, most pots don't have that. Now, some will paint it that way um, at the top where they leave a little opening. And um, I just don't. Uh, there's some people that say it's for um, to represent. Um, rain or it's used for religious ceremonies or something but that's all i um you know that um well i've heard some people say that it's to let the spirit of mm -hmm. the peace escape mm -hmm. so your pots are all very uh, uh spiritual because mm -hmm. they those spirits can't get out <laughs> <laughs> keep them in there yes there's no break in the line for them to leave huh but um i all our pieces we treat with respect that's the, the that's the thing that's all that was always um explained to me by my grandmother that you don't waste clay you ask mother nature for the clay to get you ask for permission to get the clay that you need and you only get what you need to use to make your pots you don't waste you don't waste so, mm -hmm. and uh yeah that, it's so hard yeah to, it's so hard to go get it yes. certainly um, you can't waste. So those are what we do with our pots and mm -hmm. a lot of it, um, like I said, we still use for our own personal use. So that's what all these pots are, are, are painted. Most of them are painted with a yucca brush or baby hair and um, I use commercial brushes to fill in the, um, the, um, to fill in the so black and the colors. So the hair of a 39-year-old white guy doesn't work, <laughs> does it? It didn't quite work it for us. It didn't quite work, <laughs> oh, as much as you tried. Uh -huh. Even though you thought, you know, perhaps you forgot yeah. your, uh, your... So we your, have a comment from Thomas. Thomas says it's such a joy to see and hear Rebecca. It's amazing what you guys have done these works are our national treasures thank you andrea for giving us this opportunity to learn and appreciate well who, who did is there by thomas thomas thank you that was very kind and, and and i'm sure that rebecca and amanda concur but it's a it's a real pleasure for me to have them here because i you know i've known Rebecca since the dinosaurs roam the earth <laughs> and uh, it's true I have and uh, and, and uh, I all I can say is you know she is by far the master 
and now she has, the master has someone um, right, right with her, her, her wonderful daughter, Amanda, who does incredible work. And like I said earlier, this is their Indian market. All these pieces are for sale. And uh, if, if you want a, a truly remarkable, extraordinary piece of American Indian artwork, the, these are definitely the pieces that I would recommend that, that you buy. So, Rebecca, are you ready to uh, do some more? I'm ready to get back to my painting. That's okay. what I do every day. That's what you do every day. Well, good. Well, we'll just leave the camera on okay. uh, Rebecca's pieces and, and uh, come over and see what Amanda's up to, what kind of trouble she's getting into. part of the yucca and that's what we used to scrape our um, mistakes off with but it doesn't last as long so now that's what we use so how much of that pot did you have started before you came Amanda me? Yeah. Um, I was actually barely starting. I was like right here somewhere. Uh -huh. So I'm almost she done right. one way, then I gotta go back the other way and do the lines this way. She's been working on it since last week. <laughs> hey, when you have a three year old, yeah, when you have she a will not let me paint, especially when I sit down to paint. Just well, if like, we look at that display mm -hmm. of your work, I mean, that represents a gazillion hours of, uh, mm -hmm. of labor. It's really amazing. Yeah, for me, like, before I used to be able to just sit there and paint it, but now that I'm a mom, I, it, my daughter is just, she, she always picks the time when I'm sitting down to paint, and then she wants me to hold her and carry her, read to her, and like, you know, I'm trying to paint. <laughs> So I, I'm like, no, nah, okay, I'll put my pottery down and I have to tend to my daughter. Other than that, she's outside with her grandpa. <laughs> On the tractor. <laughs> now, the feast day on September 2nd, that's not going to happen. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Do you guys ever dance? I'm not. I, I, don't, I don't dance. You know, have you, know, have not, you, not for the feast, not for September second. But, but have you ever danced? I think I did it when I was like five or six, and I remember I was so tired I fell asleep dancing. <laughs> they had to take me back. <laughs> I was done. You were done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was still little. Oh, those the, the little ones at the dances that are sort of bringing up the rear. Uh, mm -hmm. They are so adorable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've seen them just sort of just sit down and like, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you were one of those, huh? <laughs> now you dance at Feast Day. Um, and was Acoma Pueblo ever... Is that the name that the, that the, the residents of the Pueblo called the Pueblo before the Spaniards arrived? Yes. Is that the original mm -hmm. name? Yes. Because Haco is the, the, the name of the Pueblo. Haco. And, the, and then it was, how did Acoma come about? How did that word come about? Do you know? I don't it know. just I don't know. changed a little over time because yeah. it's very close. 
I know when the Spaniards came in, they renamed everything. That's uh, where we get a lot of our last names. We have a lot of um, Martinez, Sanchez, my grandmother was Sanchez, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Garcia, Chino. So that's where a lot of our Well, the last Spaniards names came name from. people and they name the Pueblos. And, and, and the Pueblos that were renamed were usually named after Catholic saints. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are several of the um, Pueblos who are going back to their original name, and several of the Pueblos that are pronouncing their names the way they pronounce them, rather than how the Spaniards took the name, and, and like Pawaki is a, a good mm -hmm. one, and Pawaki, um, still has its Indian name, but that wasn't the way the, the, the Native Americans that lived there said the yeah. name. It was, it's Posagwe, mm -hmm. which means um, place to drink water. Mm -hmm. And in Powake just became um, the Spanish version. And I think part of that in, in uh, well, part of it was because the Native Americans didn't have a, a, a written language. Mm -hmm. And so the Spaniards wrote down the name of the, the, uh, the village because they were incredible record keepers. Everybody that was baptized, everyone that got married, everyone that died, everybody that had a piece of land, they made tons and tons of maps. And as a result, that you know, they needed to write them down, and they wrote them down um, using an alphabet from the pronunciation of the, of the village. And as a result, over time, that that changed. And um, and they also renamed the the people and gave them their own Spanish names because they didn't really have last names. I think the Navajo ones are the most interesting though. It wasn't done by the Spaniards, it was done by the traders that came west um, when the opening of, of the west ha happened and they worked in the, and, and they established trading posts on the Navajo reservation and they gave the Navajo people last names but they're the, the new last name was not the last name of the trader. <laughs> it was the first name of the trader. So there's lots of Stevens and lots of Bobs and lots of Jims and lots of Joes. Right. And uh, that, you know, people till this day still keep those, those same last names. Mm -hmm. But uh, when... Um, the Spaniards came, Acoma was the last holdout uh, during the Pueblo Revolt. And there is a celebration here in Santa Fe every year, or in New Mexico every year, called Fiestas, which celebrates the peaceful, huh. <laughs> we're not gonna, no, that's in quotation marks, the, the peaceful, um, reconquering of this particular area, and the, those the times were pretty pretty horrible, and hopefully they will they'll never ever return again. But uh, so many people were subjugated, and the Spanish did a lot of cruel cool things to the. Native American people, but they're still here, mm -hmm. and they're still making pots, and they're still giggling uh, <laughs> on a Tuesday afternoon, yep. and uh, it's, you know, it's really a joy and a wonder. I had one of the most interesting experiences of my life at Acoma Pueblo, thanks to Rebecca. <laughs> Gloria Archuleta, who was in Albuquerque, used to work for me. And Rebecca invited me and Gloria to come to a governor's feast day. Well, Rebecca's husband was elected a war chief in at Acoma. 
And unlike the white guys, war chiefs don't make war. <laughs> they uh, call field chiefs. No. Yes, <laughs> they they pray for peace. And one of the obligations uh, of being elected to that uh, that honorable office is that you have to live up on top of the, the mesa. And Rebecca was telling me all about, you know, no running water. You've got to haul the water up. And it's wintertime and it's cold and, and there's no gas, no electricity. So you're heating the house by the fireplace. And of course, you've got to cook meals. And, and not only was Rebecca cooking meals for herself, but she was cooking meals for all the men, all the war chiefs that were in the, the kiva. And the kiva is you would almost equate it to a church and or a monastery where all the people all the people who are of that profession and in this case elected war chief officials would go there every day and pray for peace and rebecca was the person in charge of feeding them which meant you know, going to get groceries, you either go to Grants. How far away is Grants from? from about 35 miles. 35 miles, and, and Albuquerque is about 60? Yes. About, that's where you, that's the only place you could buy groceries. And needless to say, stay in that, say that in that year and a half um, mm -hmm. time, Rebecca spent most of her time not making pottery, but doing her wifely and cultural duty to uh, support the people who were in the kiva praying for peace. And I remember Rebecca coming in a couple of years later and said, oh, Dwight was elected again. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and, you know, from an outsider's point of view, I know that it's an incredible honor, but of the observation that I made, and I don't know if, if this is true or not, but my observation was that people that are elected to do that, because everybody in the Pueblo is religious, and you know, that's just part of their heritage in their daily life. And that people were chosen sometimes because they might have had a little more than some of the other people. And there were things that happened at the Pueblo that sort of evened that out so the community would share in some of people's extra, um, I, I hate to say riches, but extra riches. And uh, the experience that I had was at a governor's feast day. Now, mind you, Gloria and I are the only white gals there. We're the only <laughs> white people at all. And what happened is, you know, I can only tell you what I observed. First of all, we went to Rebecca's family home on the top of the mesa. And Dwight, her husband, the war chief, went to his family home. And all of Rebecca's uh, family gathered in that family home, and you know, Marilyn and Carolyn and Judy and Diane and Rebecca and all their kids and, and aunties and, and grandparents were all there. And what they had done is they had amassed an enormous amount of stuff. It was everything from oranges and boxes of rice -roni and cereal and five pound sacks of flour to socks and toilet paper and fly swatters and, and I mean, they cleaned up that Walmart in Albuquerque like you would not believe. And each person in her family had a basket and the basket was filled to the top with all those assorted goods. And luckily, Rebecca had planned ahead and had made a basket each for me and for Gloria. Well, it was so nice because Dwight, her husband, came over to talk to all of us sitting in Rebecca's home. And he had lots of prayers and lots of good wishes and lots of 
wonderful things to say about his own culture, but he wasn't really talking to us. He was talking to all of her family that was there and speaking in his native tongue. Well, you know, Gloria and I didn't know one word. And every time he would say some, something in his native tongue, he would turn to us and translate it for us and really made us feel as though we were part of this gathering. And the exact same thing was going on, only no, no white people, uh, at Dwight's house. And he was speaking to his family about um, their riches and how they share what they have with their community and how they give back not only to Mother Earth, but also to each other. And so when he was finished speaking, it was time uh, for each family to proceed to the area where the dances had been going on. And the dancers had finished with their dances and from each home came First Dwight and his family, sort of ranging in age, uh, from old to very young, each one of them armed with a, a big basket full of goods. And after they went into the area where the dancers had finished, then it was Rebecca with her family proceeding sort of the same way. And of course, the two white girls picking up the rear. Uh, and everybody with these baskets full of goods. And after the dancers were finished, all the dancers lined up and they had pillowcases. And what we did is we took something from each pill for, from our basket and put it in each one of the pillowcases as we went by the dancers. Um, in, I'm sure it was a, a, a gesture of appreciation for their dancing and a way to, again, spread the wealth. And then after we got to the end of the, the dancers, there were all the rest of the people in the Pueblo that were watching the dances up there on the mesas. And um, Dwight's family and Rebecca's family began picking things out of the, the basket and throwing them out to the crowd. It's called a giveaway. And they were giving all these things to the people of their community. And people there were with the outstretched arms catching the oranges and the, and, uh, the rolls of wax paper and all the other things that uh, Rebecca had purchased uh, on behalf of her husband. Uh, the war chief, and I had a five-pound sack of flour, and I thought, oh, God, I can't throw this out there because I'm going to give someone a concussion <laughs> if they don't catch it. And luckily, there was one nice elderly lady who was sitting watching the dances, and I just went over there and handed it to her. But it was the most wonderful gesture of generosity that I, you know, really had ever seen in, in my life so that everybody in the community was taken care of. Uh, I went to a, a, a giveaway at San Ildefonso, which was the first time I had ever seen it. And my older son, Andy, was about three and we had just lived in New Mexico for less than a year, and we went down to San Ildefonso, which is five miles from my house, uh, to see the dances, and then there was a giveaway afterwards. And here's this little blonde kid sitting in the <laughs> dirt, you know, making designs and stuff in the, in, the, in the dirt, and this wonderful lady came really close to him and she rolled an apple over to him. Well, you think you would have thought that apple was made out of gold. Andy was so happy to get that apple from her and how lovely it was of her to single him out and give him something in the giveaway. 
Now, hopefully, Rebecca and Amanda, that my observation was correct and that um, this, is there anything that you can add to this or would like to? Well, it's just a, a feast day, a governor's feast is what it was. And, and it's a governor's feast because the governor... To celebrate all the, uh, the newly affected, uh, elected officials from governor um, down to the field chiefs, the, uh, the, uh, the newly elected ones, they do what they do every year. And how, um, often, how often does this take place? Uh, just once a year. Once a year. Usually and so your different. governor only serves one, a one-year term? Used to, but now they um, uh, serve two or three terms. Two or three years yes. of the term? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yes. Yeah, it's hard um, for continuity, isn't it, if you're only serving right. one year. By the time you get started, it's time <laughs> yes. to end. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. because our present governor... Um, it's his second year, and for my brother, his uh, third year as um, uh, second lieutenant. Uh huh. But um, I'm really pleased at the way they've handled this um, coronavirus situation. Uh -huh. um, I really give them a lot of credit for what they've done for our people, now, how, keeping them safe. Have you had many cases in Akamai? No, not very many. Uh -huh. um, under under 35 or something like that uh -huh. currently but um it's been it's just one way in and one way out of the the village but um and no kids can go either way no unless they have a special appointment yes uh -huh. but, and you have uh, to prove that yes mm -hmm. but they've worked very hard um uh to keep in uh in keeping everyone safe so um i give the governor and his staff a lot of credit for all the yeah do the they have any they sort of thoughts about how long they're going to keep this up i have no idea they just um will um update us um the governor will um we've caught some on our phones of um his uh what he's told the people and then uh they'll give out um written information at the checkpoint um, if anything new is has come up, but um, they uh, they really have um, done a lot for our people. But um, it's it's been difficult difficult not being able to come and go um, the way we used to. Can't go no, to the casinos; they're closed can't go down. Can't the casino, <laughs> right? You can't go to the movies. <laughs> no movies, no and, movies. And, and like my daughter mentioned, it's been difficult on the little ones because they can't leave. Can't go so to McDonald's, no, huh? Mm -hmm. No, they okay. just stay home, so, but, um... And, and, now, Amanda, are you homeschool? I know your daughter's only three. It's mm -hmm. not as though she needs to know her times tables or how to... You know, write an algebraic equation. <laughs> right. Yeah. But so, have you done some? Have you taken up some of the the teaching things that she does? She goes to Head Start. Right? Yeah, she goes to Head Start. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, um, they actually, I am the the Head Start that she goes to at Laguna was really good. The curriculum and everything. They were even though um they it was in April, mm -hmm. they stopped going to school because of the pandemic thing. Mm -hmm. So. Um, they were sending home weekly um, packets for the kids to do with activities and stuff. So that I kind of kept that up with her. And then I started buying like um, pre preschool books and stuff. She loves to read. So she know, loves to read. She's loves three. To read. And she's um, three. Always buying her books. She wow. loves stories. Yeah. And um, you know, so um, that's pretty much it. She's a amazing little girl. I freak out on the words that she uses. <laughs> and she's just... Well, it's really scary when your three-year-old has a bigger vocabulary than yours. Yeah, right? I'm like, where did you hear that? <laughs> and, and in two languages. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she, she's caught on a lot. You know, yeah. uh, like I said, I, I try to limit her. Like, even though we hold down like to my mom's um she doesn't watch tv like she'll 
sit and then watch a movie for a while, but then she'd rather be outside. She's an outdoor person. She loves the animals. She loves playing in the dirt. And, you know, so moving up on top of the mesa. What do you mean playing in the dirt? I mean, where did that come from? That's what you guys do all day. Yeah, playing in the dirt. Playing in the dirt. Playing in the dirt with her castles. Yeah, she, she likes to be outside. And so, like, even, like I said, that change moving from having the electricity and everything up on top to no water, and it, it doesn't bother her. She she actually prefers to be at their home. <laughs> like, if I go to the store or something, since they can't leave, my mom will watch her, and she'll be calling me, where are you at? Mila wants to go home. I'm like, huh? hold on. <laughs> her favorite books are The Three Little Pigs, The Three Bears, The Billy Goat Girls. Billy Goat Girls. Ferdinand, that kind of, those kind yeah. of where, the wild things are. where the wild things are, and so we read them two, three times, mm -hmm. you know, at one sitting. So well, I'm I remember sure. your youngest daughter, Iris, she, she was, was a reader also. Yeah. Uh -huh. Hers was, Hers Harry, was Potter. Harry Potter. Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee, I, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I we came <laughs> across those old, um, the, the tapes and everything, yeah. oh my god. Said these are still here. Yes, they're still here. Yes, I belong to Iris. <laughs> well, I used to listen to books on on tape oh, yeah. in my car yes. when I was okay. driving back and forth. Yes. It's about you know twenty to thirty minutes from yeah. where I live, depending you know uh -huh. on the couple traffic lights. And, <laughs> and there were times when I spent an hour sitting in my garage. Because yeah. I couldn't turn off the Harry Potter tape because I wanted to know what happened with Professor Dumbledore. Right. <laughs> Harry Potter. My dad was taking Iris to school and he got a speeding ticket because he was so into the <laughs> listening to the listening. He said, don't play those no more. <laughs> No, did, did he tell the cop that it was the Slytherins? <laughs> the Slytherins. It was that Malfoy, that oh, nasty brown so kid that, uh, that made him do it. And yes. my dad don't speed. He, he yeah. just like, he and is the like, cop still gave him a ticket? Yeah. Oh, geez, why, we need some yeah, more literary yeah, my, my policemen <laughs> around here that would understand how Harry Potter could make him go around yeah. over the speed limit. Yeah, Harry Potter. Harry, yes, Harry Potter. Potter. Is favorite. Wow, that's, that's, yeah, that's she, really amazing. She lo she's really But she books. also likes to do, um, um, I, I uh, sing some songs uh, to her. And um, play, um, do like finger plays that we used to do in, in Keras. It's all in Keras. Uh -huh. So she likes to do those two songs. Oh, wow. Play wow. With her. Yeah, she's turning into a, a little mini Becky. She's always getting mad at me. <laughs> She'll tell me, you have to say Dawa <laughs> Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, just wait because, you know, it's. They say it's the terrible twos, but I'm convinced it's the terrible twenties. <laughs> and all, you right. know, on the day they turn 20 years old, you lose your brain. The parents <laughs> lose their brain, but yet it grows back by the time they're 30. So that, you know, and once they're 30, all of a sudden there's a whole new change about uh, their parents that, you know, they have worth, they have value, and they can actually be right some of the time. <laughs> But, you know, it, it's a real credit to um, your um, governing at the Pueblos that you guys are all safe and the, the virus isn't a, you know, attacking everyone. Mm -hmm. what, you, what, what has happened on the Navajo Reservation? That's is, terrible. Oh, it's sad. just absolutely sad. They, I mean, to the, today on the news they said that they had lost over 500, yes. or right around 500 mm -hmm. people have died. Yes as a result of that, much but, less the yes. thousands of people mm -hmm. that have gotten yeah. sick. That's why I really say, you know, give a lot of credit to our tribal administration for all the, the things that they put in place yeah. and um, all the precautionary things that they yeah. needed to, to enforce. But Yeah, I well, mean, you know, protecting people yes. who don't know or won't protect themselves. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, that is, that's really, really quite wonderful. So, Amanda, 
Yeah. I'm going to ask you a really funny question because I'm not so sure you have an answer. Yeah. Uh, especially with the pandemic and a three-year-old. Uh, what do you do for fun? <laughs> hey. Hey. Oh. I actually just, um, out of luck, I, I actually got hired back as a Head Start teaching staff. So I'll be, hopefully soon, be going back. Yeah. Back to teaching, yeah. So. Oh, well, that's great. I know you had that uh, time at the museum. Where yeah, you, uh, I, the, since the, you know, everything's closed and there's no tourists or anything. So I had to try to find some other means of financials. So I applied and actually got in. So I'm looking well, forward to that. Well, do, do they think that the school in, at Acoma is going to start up soon? Um, right now, I think it's, they're just doing the um, online for now. Uh -huh. As far as I know, I'm, I'm not too familiar with that. But uh, I think that's what they're doing. They're actually... Um, I know the Department of Education at Acoma is actually putting in the Wi-Fi lines, so it's accessible to the whole Pueblo. Uh huh. So that's what they're working on now. Yeah, but other than well, pretty that, soon your three-year-old's gonna teach you how to use she a computer to, and an iPad. She already and knows how to take pictures. I didn't even know. I was telling my mom I was washing dishes up on up at our house, and she had my phone, and I was looking at it later, and I was like. Were you taking my picture? She's <laughs> like, yeah, mom, I was like, yeah. <laughs> uh oh, uh oh, uh -oh. Booger. <laughs> I can't figure out something on my phone. She tries to take some of my phone away. Yeah, she's like, like this, this grandma. grandma. Like this. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's always watching. Like I said, she's very observant, so she'll sit there and watch. Well, who's hungrier? Me. Okay. Well, you get to go My first. My stomach is talking to me. That's what um, Mila will say. So that's what all that noise is in the background? Yeah. It was oh, at the dog. It was at the dog. Uh, <laughs> so well, I'll talk to Amanda for a while. And if you want to go grab a bite, Rebecca, that okay. would be just great. <laughs> so, Amanda, what do you, what do you foresee? Um, the designs to be finished other on that pot, other than uh, the lines that you're going in both directions. Now, are you going to fill in all those little diamonds yes. or something? So as soon as I start going the other way and get the second line on the others, then they're going to be little diamonds like um, Rebecca's plate here. Oh yeah. And then from there, I don't know. I'll see what I can. I actually already kind of think I know what I'm going to put on there. Have, have you been tempted? I mean, I do this at home all the time. If I'm, I like the the old tiles, and I have I have tiles in my house, some in the kitchen, uh -huh. and, and some in a room where I sort of keep all my books. Oh yeah. Well, I always put one in upside down, <laughs> <laughs> or a completely different design. Yeah. But in the same in the same color. Yeah. palette and just so that they're not all the same have you ever thought about making one of those little diamonds something really different from all the rest i've been wanting to i was going to tie it actually on a plate i think it would be easier on a plate because it's kind of more flat than yeah this and then it's sort of fun to you know it's yeah. sort of like where's waldo right <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so well, we're going to put one of the cameras on Rebecca and Amanda's work. Uh, and that way you guys at home will be able to see the beautiful things that they do. And, you know, if you're interested in purchasing any of the pieces, the easiest thing to do is to go to our website. First, you go to the homepage, and it's andreafisherpottery.com. The reason that it's andreafisherpottery.com instead of andreafisherfinepottery.com is the name is too long. So it came out as Andrea Fisher Fine Pot. <laughs> and I thought 27 <laughs> years ago that, you know, I'm not so sure that I wanted to attract that crowd. <laughs> 
But now that it's legal and people are actually making money um, off of it, off of that industry of growing and processing, uh, maybe I made a mistake, I don't know. But And so we dropped the fine instead of the... Um, <laughs> the and leaving it at pot. And, uh, and I remember when we first started up and it was, you know, there was the logo on the screen that said Andrea Fisher Fine Pottery and some lovely person called me and congratulated me on my marriage because they thought that I had married Mr. Fine. And so Andrea Fisher became Andrea Fisher Fine Pottery rather than Andrea Fisher Fine Pottery. And uh, so anyway, we go to that website and then click on the, um, on the uh, artists and then look for the L box and click on L. You'll see Amanda right near the beginning of the L words are pr pretty close, and Rebecca um, a little further down because they're all there by al alphabetical order first la uh, last name and then the first yeah. name. Anyway, do we have a question? We don't have a question, it's actually a comment, and it says, Hello from Sky City, marvelous demonstration. I look forward to seeing you on August 29th from Marilyn Ray. <laughs> oh, that's your t that's Rebecca's sister, your auntie. Yeah, hi auntie. <laughs> yeah, I hope you can hear us, Marilyn. I have one of your storytellers here because we were talking about how storytellers are grandparents that pass the culture on to their kids when they live on the top of the mesa and they don't have any TV or electricity or water or any of those other kinds of things, and that's what they did in the old days, and the, this is a representation of them, and that's yeah. how you make a fabulous, fabulous storyteller, uh, of course all different, and that you're going to be here right near the end of the month. I can hardly wait to see you in Cinnamon. Um, she, yeah. has, she has a, um, a pit bull that you think are the most ferocious dogs in the universe, and they'll bite your yeah. face off if you look at them wrong. <laughs> But she has cinnamon, and cinnamon is the sweetest creature in the universe. And yeah, you know, with your face, he'll 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 get rid of your face, all right, but he'll lick it off. Uh, a sweet, sweet dog. Yeah, cinnamon. But yeah, Marilyn's going to be here later on in the month. <laughs> so Amanda, when you first started, well. Did you always live in that the family house that was down on the, below the mesa? Yes, that's or, where I grew up. That's where you grew up, mm -hmm. and so now you're re sort of returning to that the old the way ways up on top. Mm -hmm. And and how, what's your day like uh, living up on top of the the mesa? Oh, right now it's just uh, you know our day starts early. We get up at seven. And my daughter will still stay asleep, but I clean the house, wash the dishes, just a normal day. And then once I'm done, I'll sit down and I'll just work but on But you the wash the dishes, so, and there's no water With a pan of there. water. <laughs> where, where did that water come from? Oh, uh, my dad will haul water for us. Cause Your dad to does? Yeah, so he'll bring us gallons of water and we just... Aren't you a lucky it. girl? Yeah. <laughs> now, if you lived uh, at Acoma, say in the 1700s, where would how would you get water? Probably from one um one of the water systems that are up there. There's a few on the mesa that you know that still do collect water, so that's where you know. So we, what what you mean that there's like places where the water pools after the mm -hmm. rain? Yeah, there uh -huh. it's in the rocks. So, uh huh. And so know, when it rains, it flows down there, yeah. and so you wind up with little um like. Water, like little ponds water yeah. mm -hmm. of water that yeah. are in the crevices of mm -hmm. the, the rocks on the mesa. Yes. And uh, how, I mean, guess who collected the water? The women, right? <laughs> <laughs> Somehow they get to do the dirty Somehow work. we have to do all the, the hauling, yeah. yeah all the hauling. Can you imagine that? That's what the, um, the dryers were for. But there wasn't any road down there, and there wasn't a ladder. How did yeah. you get, how would people get down to the water? Um, there's, um, 
like the stairway going up on top of the mesa there, there's ways to get down there it's, into the is water. Is it carved into? Yes, it's carved into the rock and uh -huh. there's little handholds to help Hand you know, pull yourself up. Yeah. Well, if, the, if you need to pull yourself up and there are handholds, how can you hang on to the water? Right? <laughs> Very steady hand. Very steady. <laughs> one hand on the pot, one hand on the rock. <laughs> and and the pot is balanced on your head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and is that why they why you have First a, that little yeah that little, to, the little indentation yeah. at the bottom of every yeah. pot? And mm -hmm. I would assume that you don't carry the water around on your head anymore, uh, but uh, the indentations still remain. Mm -hmm. And especially with your hairdo today, <laughs> that would make it even harder to carry water right? on, uh, on your head. Uh -huh. I know, my hair is so thick, it's just, that's why I always keep it up. It's is that part of the reason why Akama pottery is so thin? Is because uh, water would, water, women make the pots and women carry the water, mm -hmm. and uh, if the you know, you can't change the weight of the water, mm -hmm. but you can change the weight, the weight of the of pots. The pot, yeah. And, uh, you know, maybe that's why the the Akama pots are so thin <coughs> compared to some of the I other so, yeah. pots. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I would think so, too. <laughs> yeah. What a hard life that must have been. Right? I always think about that. And like I said, working in the museum was like a huge eye-opener for me because I got to see a lot of um, the old artifacts that we have there, you know, and it, it just, I was, was mind blown by some of the stuff that's in there and I was just like, wow, like, they use this stuff, <laughs> you know, like, how, I wouldn't have even thought of that, even now, I'm like, I, how would I use that, <laughs> you know, but they were like smart people, like really smart to survive and to get by, it, it's, yeah. They, they, yes. were, they had to figure things out mm -hmm. or they didn't survive. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. so there's a big, enormous church up on yeah. top of the Mesa. How did that happen? I mean, it's a Catholic church and it's enormous. And it's probably yeah, one of the church. biggest churches in New Mexico because, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it's gigantic. How, yeah. how, do you know how that church was built? Not really. You would have to ask Becky. I, I'm not too familiar with well, that. Then, you mean your mama? <laughs> yeah, my mama. I, mama. I'm not too well, familiar with that. Well, I will ask her that because yeah. uh, it is something but that's is. really amazing. That's that, like the highlight of the tours. Like, what, you know, I would ask people, you know, how was your tour when they come back? And they're like, oh, the church, the church. That's like the main comment we get is, the church is just beautiful, you know, and it, it draws the attention. That's like one of the places that. Yeah, well, that's one thing. Before, you know, when I first moved here, you could just drive up to the Pueblo, oh, yeah. to the top of the Mesa, because there was a, a, a sort of a bit of a road. Yeah. It, you know, going up and down was like riding a roller coaster. <laughs> right. Oh my God, it's kind of that scary. <laughs> Uh, I think the first time I was there, I walked up because there was no way in the oh, world yeah. I was going to drive <laughs> on that. It was it's sort of like a ramp that goes yeah. straight up uh, uh -huh. 300 feet, Real, really <laughs> scary. And um, oh, that you could wander around and there were lots, not lots, but a bunch of families yeah. that lived there. One, one of the things that I thought was really interesting is there were a couple windows um, in, in the houses that are in Pueblo style, like apartment houses, mm -hmm. uh, stacked on top of each other. Mm -hmm. um, because I, there's not enough room on the mesa mm -hmm. for people to They're spread built. out like mm -hmm. suburbia. Yeah. Uh, it's more like city living where um, the houses were uh, many stories mm -hmm. tall yeah. and the windows were made out of mica yeah. and you know mica occurs naturally here in New Mexico and it's sort of mine like flagstone and sheets yeah. Yeah. and uh, they used those windows so that light could get into the apartment 
buildings mm -hmm. uh, in on the top of the mesa, mm -hmm. and uh, mica is translucent, so light would come through. I mean, you couldn't see your friends walking by if you were looking <laughs> out of a yeah. mica window, but at least, you know, you got some daylight yeah. coming in. And, you know, but, yeah. and for people then, most of their lives were spent outside. Yeah. And so it wasn't that important to have windows to see what was right. going on outside, but it would mm -hmm. light, light in. And then a room that might be behind it, yeah. It would be your only source of light because there was no electricity. Yeah. And, uh, and it was really interesting to see the mica windows. But now, you, uh, unfortunately, the top of the mesa uh, that I was talking about where the church is, it's basically used for ceremonies. Uh -huh. And yes, you can go visit, but you must be escorted yeah. by a guide. Mm -hmm. yes. And apparently your mama was a guide for a while. You know, I was telling her, um, I was actually in the research library one day. I was putting some files and stuff, maps and stuff away. And I came across, um, 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 I guess back then that was their way of um, keeping track of um, their daily tours or whatever. Uh -huh. But um, it was a notebook and I was looking through it and I saw my mom's name in there yeah. as, a, as a tour guide. And this was back in like 19, oh, what did I say, 1980 or something? I don't, I don't mm -hmm. remember, but I started laughing and I went home and I told her, I was like, I didn't know you were a tour guide. Yeah. <laughs> I, was like, I saw your name signed in. Uh -huh. <laughs> but yeah, now you have to uh, register at the cultural center. And then from there, the tours run every hour on the half hour mark. So from there, it's uh, about an hour and a half tour now that they do with uh -huh. the guide. Yeah, yeah with the guide. Because yeah. I don't want people roaming around in yeah. places that they use for religious purposes. Yeah. That's sort of, you know, like roaming around St. Peter's <laughs> right. in Rome yeah. uh, or the Vatican. I mean, that's yeah. not going to work. Exactly. Uh, and, so, uh, yeah. and so you have guided tours. Now. Yeah, we have the guided tours. And then yeah, do you have to make a reservation for these guided tours? Oh, uh, no. Just Only show if up. it's a party of 15 or more, then they um, they prefer that you call in ahead of time and um, schedule that. But other than that, you can just basically show up there and take your tour. Uh -huh. it's, it's about an hour and a half long. About an hour and a half. Yeah, because when, when I was there, for one visit, I think when my older son and his girlfriend uh -huh. came out, we, uh, and it was, oh, it, I think it was feast day, uh -huh. like the 2nd of September, oh, okay. and we came to your family home and we ate, yeah. and Rebecca had been a tour guide and she took us on a private <laughs> tour, there you go. and I got to see where the places where the water Oh yeah, uh, but uh, now is that water ever used now? Not really. Not Do really. people use it in their pottery making? Because rainwater is so rain much water nicer. Rainwater we use for the um, colors, the colors that we use for the pottery. Uh -huh. Yeah, helps yeah. it stand out more. Yeah. So yeah. it's still used, you know, but we don't. It's not used for drinking anymore as much. So yeah. it's just used for. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, it's, I can I can imagine <laughs> it's a little more. It's a little easier to turn on the tap. Right. <laughs> and then, when, did, when did water get put into Akamai? Any? Do you have any ideas? Oh, I don't know. I, I can't say. But I remember um, the road wasn't always paved to go up on top of the mesa. Oh, no. That dirt road. Because my dad used to work for um, the Pueblo of Akama. And he used to drive this huge water truck, and that was one of his um, duties was to drive that water truck up and wet the up road. That road. And then come back down, yeah. Because he would honk me. outside the house, and I would jump in the truck and go with him and yeah. get fascinated. And you both lived to tell the tale. That's <laughs> yeah. the part that's so interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, um, like I, but I don't know. I don't know when, when the water and everything got put in. Not too sure on that. But I know that like, everything kind of basically ends at our house, the running water, electricity, and all that. Well, next door to my brother. My brother lives next door. So it comes, what, from I-40? 
or in that direction and towards your house? Or, or there, there must be wells around somewhere. Yeah, there's, um, they have one on the, they got rid of it at the Howard, the water tank thing they used to have, but now there's water there, mm -hmm. the, the well thing, because they come up and check the... Well, we're really lucky in New Mexico because there's an enormous, gigantic, <laughs> wa um, Oh, what do you call it? It just slipped my mind. An aquifer <laughs> yeah. under the state of New Mexico. So, mm -hmm. um, yes, there's no water on the surface, but there's yeah. plenty of it yeah. underground. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that you have to get to it. Yeah. I know at my house, first water is at about 25 feet. Really? Uh huh. Wow. And in the city of Santa Fe, first water is at about 400 feet. So um, the house that I live in, it's very old and it has a hand dug well. Oh, and that's yeah. still the water that I use. Really? But, oh. but here in, in Santa Fe, uh -huh. uh, they have to drill down oh, yeah. hundreds of feet before they hit water. But once you get there, there's plenty. Yeah. It's just the surface water. And you can't depend on the rain and the snow melt. Yeah. Because, you know, like this year, it's just dry yeah, yeah, as a bone. It was really terrible. scary. Really it scary. Because even as I was telling my mom, I was like, it hasn't rained, and then like two weeks ago, we finally got that week of rain, so that was good. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, Rebecca, oh, how, you, how, was, how was your <laughs> peanut butter and sauerkraut sandwich? <laughs> Delish. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I need a nap. <laughs> I can lay down on the dog bed. Yeah, with the dogs. Yeah, there, there are a couple dog beds <laughs> around here. Pick, you know, take your choice. Yeah. Stella, okay. who's a short haired one, he likes lots of pillows. <laughs> and he likes to sleep on the floor. So, you know, pick your poison. Now, what are you doing there? I'm just remixing the paint so I can start painting again. You can start painting and, yeah. and Amanda, if you want to grab something to eat. Okay. You got a peanut butter and soft crab sandwich too. <laughs> <laughs> we, could, we could probably add a little strawberry jelly to yours. Yeah, right. Sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So was... we were talking about you being a tour guide up at Apple Oh Pueblo. gosh, that was years ago. Yeah. But I could still walk. You could still, and you're having yeah. difficulty walking now? Yes, I have the problems with my knee, and then I fell well, didn't and you, broke didn't my you, knee. Didn't you have your knee replaced? I had a knee replacement, but, um, and it was doing really, I was doing good on that, but then I fell in the snow oh. about two, three years ago, and I had to have surgery. I broke it just above my knee. You so, broke your leg? Yeah, um, no, it was um, right above my knee, yeah. um, right o almost um, close to where I had my um, my kneecap, well, uh -huh. where my kneecap is, right, just right above it, and it uh -huh. was on the side, so I really messed up my, my leg pretty bad, so it hurts, but I'm oh. good. This is what I do every day. That's what you do. That's your drug of choice, mm -hmm. huh? It's yeah. painting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, what yeah, did so, you want to know about the being a tour guide? Yeah, about being a tour guide. What was that like? Um, it was fun. I met a lot of people. Yeah. What um, was the What was the dumbest question you ever got? Um, <laughs> what we ate. <laughs> what do you eat? Um, and uh, my what do you eat? You mean like McDonald's and. Something well, other than what you could buy at the grocery <laughs> store? Did you eat something different yeah. than that? Um, yeah, and then the other one was um, what I wore. I said, well, I'm wearing what I always wear. Um, so, uh, and people think that um, all Indians live in teepees. <laughs> or that we all wear war bonnets or we all wear feathers in our hair. You, you don't? No. Oh. <laughs> 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 so, um, they, they, we, our houses are made from adobe or rocks, and that's what a lot of us have. And then uh, Marilyn, like Marilyn and them, Carolyn, 
They're trailer trash people. They're trailer trash. Oh no, oh no, oh no. Well, you know what the dumbest question I get from people is they walk in the gallery and here we are with several thousand pieces of pottery mm -hmm. that are, you know, all different from each other and all arranged by area so that you can get an idea of all the different places that they come from. People look me straight in the eye and say, oh, you're Andrea Fisher. Did you make all of these? <laughs> and I always say, yes. <laughs> yes, I did. Yes, I did. <laughs> Uh, you know, how, can, how can you go wrong? Huh? <laughs> but I figured, you know, a, an interesting question like that deserves an interesting answer. <laughs> <laughs> but it was nice. I worked, um, the, of course, the Pueblo, we didn't have the, the real nice um, center that we have now. In fact, the one that they did have burnt down several years ago, so that's a new um, culture center that they uh, that they built. It's in. not right across the street from you. Yes, and it's just a hop there? and a skip away. And yeah, could throw rocks at those people <laughs> that come yeah. in here. Huh? <laughs> yeah. When I was a tour guide, people went and drove to the top of the mesa, uh -huh. and yes, they parked scary either road. behind the church or in front of the, the, uh -huh. the um, by the church, and. Um, there were um, about five of us guides, and we were open from seven o'clock, from sunrise to sundown, I guess you could say. Yikes. But um, it, was, it was nice because we, like I said, we met a lot of, um, I met a lot of interesting people. Anybody famous? Uh, not, like was not when Clooney I was, there? no. George Clooney, oh no, darn. Nobody <laughs> like that, but yeah. a lot of people who were, um, um, I think I would say majority of the people were really um, uh, nice, friendly. Um, we had a few people who were, um, um, I guess, I, I can't say they were mean or rude, but um, just not having the understanding of what, what um, our culture was I all about. Is it, is a good it, word. Is. <laughs> <laughs> we won't go there, my because but, all those people that are watching us today, they're going to have, they have, they're now getting so much knowledge about the, uh, the people of Acoma Pueblo and what mm -hmm. they do and who they are, that they will never be those people that didn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> but we have a lot, a lot of um, our people that um, are, um, who do um, visit the, the, the village mm -hmm. and it's it was really different this year with um, all this going on it was like really um, lonely lonely. <laughs> yeah. lonely and um, because and and I, I really hurt for a lot of our people because there's a lot of vendors who go up there and um, for some I would say maybe about oh gosh the majority of the, the vendors that's their only income. Oh, so people and because, who come to the Pueblo yes, and buy things and now they can't get yes, in. Yes, they can't get in. Uh -huh. And um, I heard for those people because, like I said, that that's their only source of income. And uh -huh. with the Pueblo shut down and everything, it's, it's, it's been pretty difficult on them. Right. And for all of us, really, because... Oh, um, that's, yeah, that's why we're doing this, to support you. Uh, and the, the people, the pieces that people buy are, um, you know, that can go in your pocket. So. Yes, with all the bills. I mean, the bills are still coming in. Oh, and yeah. There's no way to pay. And it's, um, and it's hurting a lot of them, the, our, our people. Yeah. But um, we're, we're still there for one another. Yeah. Um, I'll just call in. I call a lot of my uh, friends, relatives, just to just to see how they're how they're doing. And um, it was hard because we couldn't um, um, have our feast days, September second, yeah. August tenth, our other feast day at Comida, the feast day at McCarty's in May. Uh, Everything was canceled. Everything was canceled. So. And you know, feast days, it's really interesting because 
we think of, fe you know, if you're ha in, in, in my culture, a feast day would be thought of as a party, mm -hmm. but feast days are not parties on mm -hmm. the, um, the Native American reservations. Mm -hmm. What they are is sort of religious ceremonies in combination with visiting family that may have moved away because the families come back for, for feast day. It's a way of seeing old friends and it's a way of sharing food yes. together. It's sort of, you know, like, like Christmas uh, in a Christian religion where, you know, the, you have the religious aspect where you go to church and you have the, the family and eating aspect. It's sort of like Passover uh, in, the, in the Jewish culture where you gather around a meal and the, the meal is part of the, uh, the, religious, um, the religious process, the identification. And, uh, and the same thing is true of feast days. And, you know, you don't get to see your friends and your family and, and um, do those things that are the continuation and the, the sort of the, I don't want to say trademarks, but the, the process of your religion because a lot of it is, is not only tied to the religion, but it's also tied to the seasons of the year as well. And... Uh, those kinds of things, you know, not to have those kinds of things is really, really tough. It has been really tough. I think it's been tough for, for everyone, everywhere. Yeah. But um, I guess once we get through this, we'll be able to have our yeah. feast days and our celebrations yeah. with our families and well, friends you again. You know, I was talking to my older son who lives in New York, and, you know, things are starting to open up there. Mm -hmm now because they've done such a good job of curbing the, mm -hmm. the increase in the number of cases. Mm -hmm. And he said, just think about all the things that happen over time after the Black Plague mm -hmm. in, in Europe. What did we have? We had the Renaissance and all the great artwork and architecture that was produced. And after the, um, the Spanish flu, in 1918, part of it um, was caused by the Second World War because all these countries were mixing with each other because they didn't have airplanes then. And first then, World War. but the first, first World what did I say? The second. second. Oh, <laughs> never, never mind. But after the First World War, boy, that was a long <laughs> war. Let me tell you, by like 30 years. And uh, but uh, after. After that, the, you know, and the war, the pandemic sort of ended the war, which w was really good. And then what happened? I mean, the Roaring Twenties showed up and <laughs> women cut off their black crinoline skirts and cut their hair and they got the right to vote. And so maybe there's hope that after this pandemic, Maybe we'll have some fabulous technology. Maybe we'll all have ro robots around the house and they can pound the heck out of your clay <laughs> yeah, and do the vacuuming no. and go to the uh, grocery store. <laughs> uh, who knows what's going to come out of this pandemic? Uh, I think that the, the biggest thing or the most important thing for me going through this has um, really made me more aware of um, family. Family. Yeah. Uh, the importance of family because I miss my my children. We're not all together, and uh, it's it's um, made me refocus on life and the things. A lot of things that we've taken for granted. Yeah. And um, like I said, I really, really do admire the leadership of our governor, Brian Bio. I give him a lot of credit for all that he's done um, and being there for the people. They even visited us, which was so... They? You mean the, the, the governor? administration came uh -huh. to my house uh -huh. and of course I looked a mess and they came 
They brought us flowers. Oh. <laughs> Presented us with flowers and they brought some, um, I think they were carrots or something. I don't remember what it was, but the main thing that I remember is the tribal administration coming in and talking to us and greeting us. And that was really, really um, a very something. thoughtful thing to do. Yes. Uh -huh. I, they, it, they didn't it, have to do that. They didn't have to no. do it, but it was really meaningful. It really yeah. meant a lot to us. And um, I made sure that they knew how much we appreciated yeah. that. Now, did you did you extend your appreciation with your pajamas on? <laughs> <laughs> no, we wrote thank you notes and oh, cards and thank signs you and stuff oh. to try to have an one of, one of my friends says she gets up in the morning and she takes off her nightgown and puts on her bathrobe. And then at night she takes off her bathrobe and puts on her nightgown. And it's sort of been like that for months now. <laughs> she says yeah. she doesn't care. No one's going to see yeah, her. I know. We just get up and do, do what our, you do. What and you yeah. Do. Yes, because can't go anywhere. There's nobody coming by. Mm -hmm. There's usually tourists walking up and down the road during the, um, the summertime uh -huh. and um, the peak season and all the tourist season is usually June and July and then it starts going down in August but uh -huh. we still have a lot of traffic coming through until after September 2nd. Well I don't know about you Rebecca but I've had great difficulty with the social social distancing mm -hmm. Especially from my refrigerator. <laughs> well, I mean, it sits there every day and it keeps calling my name, and I keep opening the door, and there's got to be something there that I pick at. And consequently, let's say the wardrobe isn't exactly the right size anymore. But uh, I wish there would have been some way for someone to put crime scene <laughs> tape around my refrigerator so that I wouldn't I go think there. That's but true for a lot of people. Yeah, well, and just missing people. Yes. I mean, you guys are closed off in the Pueblo, but can you see each other in the Pueblo? When, um, Not really. They no. still um, have um, people like you know, with our. Um, the rooster pools and everything that was just mostly for the people that, that are up there. Uh -huh. And it was sad to see how things went, but they still carried out their, their duties and responsibilities that would normally uh -huh. happen. But it was, um, it, was, it was something to see, something to experience. And um, like I said, made, 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 our, um, made us open our eyes. As yeah. to, you know, all the things that, like I said, to me, I felt like I took a lot of things for granted. And it's made me appreciate my people, my family, um, and just seeing things around us that we, we never even knew that were there. We were able to observe things. And like with, with my granddaughter, we would go for a walk. And she knows, she looks for the, the rocks and she'll just kind of scrape it on another rock and she goes, nope, that's not paint. And she'll throw and she's it and she'll, three. Yes. And she's three she'll so. look for the paint and she'll tell her mom, mom, this is a good paint rock. What do you and do? she'll give it to her and she'll go around and she knows what the wild tea looks like. So yeah. she even last night she took a whole handful of wild tea up for um for her mom. The wild tea looks like sticks. Yeah. Uh, it looks like a bunch <laughs> of sticks. <laughs> and little yellow flowers but, um, that you stick in water. It's really yeah. tasty, too. Yeah, so she she um, she's learned to pick things. And even with the um, the, the, um, the plant that we um, we use, we, we eat, and she she can identify those. You know, just how they be open. So, um, what are you gonna do when she's 14? Oh my gosh, I don't know. Ah, uh, yeah, you're in trouble. Oh my god, you're in trouble. Yeah, she's, um, she's, she's going to, she's a bright, uh, bright little girl, and, um, I think it's made us, um, uh, gotten closer to her, and it's been really nice to. I don't have to rush with my pottery, I have time to spend with her and just being with my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, to play with them, to sing with them, to to just 
go here and there with them. So yeah, the scramble and egg, even. Yeah. So wow. It's been, it's been, uh, um, it's opened our eyes a lot, for me anyway. And instead of looking at things in a negative way, we've um, looked at things in a more positive way. Good for you. No wonder your pots are so beautiful. <laughs> now, we were talking about being on top of the mesa, and I had asked uh, Amanda about the church. It mm -hmm. um, was built in 1629. 1629. Yes, the church was built wow. in 1629. And the, the thing that I, th I wish they would go back to, and that was always the highlight, the only highlight right now is going down the stairway. But... A lot of the people that came used to go through the whole um, the church. They would go through the whole convento area there, and they, they would climb up to the top, and they could see the pueblo from the top of what they said. Used oh, on to top be, of the but, church, you would look down not, not on the, the top, top of the, the mesa. Church. Yes. Yeah. But when they go inside, you take them up the stairs, and then there's like a little room that they said used to be used as a classroom, and. Um, you could see the village from there. They come back down, go around, and they could see the thickness of the walls of the church just going through there. How thick are the walls? And, oh roughly. gosh, it's like about maybe eight feet thick. Oh wow! From the base, and then it just goes up. But um, they don't do that. That's you know, it's just inside the church and out. But um, it's it was something really for a lot of the people to experience to see that. And they no longer take them down to the water holes. Um, they, we, we, um, when I was a guy, we used to be able to take them down there and have them see where the water would collect when it rained. And that, that used to be the main source of the water for our people. And then, of course, if we had windmills, we had a windmill down, down at the bottom of the mesa where we got our water. And even that, we had to go over and get water early in the morning in buckets. I remember that was my daily chore, morning and evening. And to... This is when you lived up there permanently? Yes. Mm -hmm. And oh, how old were you then? Oh, well, I've lived there all my life. Yeah. Since I was but, a when, girl. but when you got the water, how old were you when it was your chore to fetch the water? I was like about eight, nine, eight? ten. Mm -hmm. Why, the water's heavy. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. you could only carry, what, maybe a gallon at a time? Yes, we had these lard cans that they saved. They were like eight gallon, eight pound above, yeah. uh, cans or something. That's a gallon. Then, yeah, uh -huh. so that, that's what we used. Carry the water to fill it up halfway. But that's what we used. And then we had, um, like I said, the windmill. But um, it was hard. It was a hard life. And then we had to hand wash all our clothes in a tub with a ringer, yeah. washboard. <laughs> <laughs> and so what would you do with that water? I mean, it's so precious. It seems like, you know, you maybe could water a tree or something. Mm -hmm. Just with a dump it out to where, where they had something, uh, especially the rinse water, we had we would water our, our trees, whatever trees we had. Uh -huh. We had a little vegetable garden. And could you have a little garden up on top, or did you? No. Was everything grown down below? Because no, you're on a rock, like basically, up there. Yes. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. And that's where we walked. I remember when I was little, we walked on top, right up on top of the mesa. We slept there. We ate there, and get up early in the morning at five o'clock, and we're back down at the bottom of the mesa. That's where my grandma would make pottery every day. When when Paula Esteban was here. She said that she too grew up up on the top, and when it was really hot in the summertime, they used to go lay on the rocks because mm -hmm. the rocks were cool. Yes, and find a shady place and on the just, rocks. I mean, it's so steep. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's 300 feet straight down in some places. Mm -hmm. Didn't anybody ever fall off? Um, my grandmother said yes. There was a, a, a young boy that fell off the mesa. Wow. And then um, I remember, oh gosh, I don't know, several years ago, it was a little child that fell off the east side of the mesa. Uh -huh. So you really have to watch the kids when you're yeah. up there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, hi, yes. Eric, are you going to talk to? Yeah, I'll talk to Do you want, you want anyone to talk about their yeah. pots? 
go over there and talk to their pot about their pots. You want to stretch their Rebecca? You want to stretch your legs a little, or do you want to just you want to sit for a while? We can do the pots. Yeah. Okay. So why don't you find your way over there and then we can uh, talk about some of the materials that we brought. Okay, and then you can come back and do that. Okay. Hey Rebecca, tell them over here with all of your pieces. How you doing? Good. Feel a little full, nice yes. after that lunch. Yes. So. Why don't you grab a piece and tell me about it? Um, okay. Maybe a seat pot. Sure. The seat pots um, were not the way they look now. They were round. Um, pinch pots and not very large. They were maybe about this size here and probably about the height of that uh, jar. And the holes, of course, were a lot larger on top, and they were used for storing seeds. Um, and they, they weren't painted. They had no design on them. They were just clay pots, and, pinch pots. And so. the purpose, correct, was to s keep the seeds safe yes. over the winter. Right. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, if you're a farming society mm -hmm. and you need to eat the next year without your seeds, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yes. So that's where they would put them. And then, they, of course, they use them for other things. But, but a lot of the pots were used for, um, um, for personal use, um, like I said, to store seeds to store food to carry water so that's um and our pots weren't for sale they were used until um i think my grandmother used to say when the train came through mm -hmm. that's when they started selling um their um their work a lot of the people and then the, the spaniards came and they started selling them and there's some people that sent some of my grandmother's pottery back and uh and they would say, well, we bought this from your grandmother, and this was already back, like, before I was even born. And they would say, we bought it on the side, the 066, and I bought it for $2. <laughs> but $2 in that time period was a whole lot of money. Yes. <laughs> No, um, really. I mean, ice cream cones were two cents. <laughs> right. And, you know, a, a ticket for the trolley or the mm -hmm. bus was a do was it was a penny. Right. I mean, it was two dollars was a decent amount mm -hmm. of money in the nineteen twenties. Yeah. So um, our pots have come a long way, mm -hmm. and um, even the designs, the artists, a lot of the artists no longer just do traditional design. They've all gone off. Um, to uh, creating or uh, painting, and you can tell, like right now, you can tell. You can say, look at a pot and say, oh, I know that's the Cernal's pottery, Barbara and Joseph Cernal, or you can look at a pot and say, oh, well, that's that was the late Dorothy Terrivio's pottery, or uh, Federica Antonio. You can see because their their pots are different. That's just them, you know, that they, they, they've come up with their own um, designs that they've um, done and you can tell who who the potter is so um, I like I said a lot of potters the new artists they're really really nice the way they paint um, I I see a lot of um, new artists coming up and, uh, and I'm, well that's I'm really good because that, that means that the, it's going to continue mm -hmm. into the future yes. and that's actually what the purpose of mm -hmm. all of this is mm -hmm. is so that this art form does continue mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. the future mm -hmm. and you know we have a piece here from the late 1980s this <laughs> giant plate <laughs> of yours um and so you know you've progressed as an artist since the time of this plate <laughs> and um you know and so i think that the designs have gotten a whole lot more detailed at the same time so here's a here's now a plate that is a new one and I'm going to just zoom in for you real quick so that you can kind of see a little bit better 
and uh, you can really see that the detail level has really increased over that time period. And it's really amazing to see you just today painting those beautiful, thin, perfect lines as it goes every <laughs> single time. And I mean, yes, you do make mistakes and you mm -hmm. use your little tool mm -hmm. to clean, to scrape it off mm -hmm. if you need to. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, it's just really amazing to watch you work. And I'm really, really thankful that you're here and that you're healthy. And it seems like everybody at Acoma seems to be pretty healthy. And uh, it seems that everybody is trying to get through this with mm -hmm. everybody's human interest in mind, <clears throat> which, you know, these days it seems somewhat rare. Mm -hmm. And I think as it's, it's, it's a, it's a uh, community, as a Pueblo, a tribe, I think we've all gotten close because I think we're all, we all miss each other even we may have, like, a year or two ago, you know, got, got into some kind of confrontation <laughs> with one another. Now we miss each other. Yeah, now you miss those confrontations. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you know it's really quite wonderful. You know, mm -hmm. the, we I think one thing that is coming out of this that is uh, that is kind of different is the idea that this is something uh, this some that we are one people on mm -hmm. one planet and mm -hmm. we are all in this together. Mm -hmm. And these these designs that you create are just so beautiful. Is there a, a reason why you? Uh, are really fond of the geometric designs? Um, no, it's just something that I thought I could, um, I didn't think I could do, but I thought I, it was just more like a personal challenge mm -hmm. to see what I could do. And um, it, was, it was difficult at first because I had to scrape the design off. I kept making mistakes. It wasn't coming out even. It was you know, crooked or um, it just wasn't coming out right for me. And I think I stressed over one jar for about three weeks. Um, so I just scraped off all the design, smoothed it back out, reapplied the slip and started all over again. Yeah, so did that like, work? Was that a yes. successful mm -hmm. method? Yes. So that's how I knew that I could you know, not just get rid of the whole pot um, altogether, but you could, you know, um, get the design to come off, scrape it off, and um, reapply it. But it all depends on the thinness of the pot as well, because if you um, put too much of that white slip on there, it will crack at the top, on the, by the mouth of the, the jar, or the plate on the edge. Yeah, and then I have a question. It seems like right in here that you have a dark red, you have a kind of yellow, and you have an orange. Mm -hmm. How do you make those colors? Those are from different um, places that we collected. This, um, this the, the color that you see here, the, the rust color or the red color there, that's really, um, when we go back over, I'll show you where uh, that paint is um, like yellow. Um, it's not that color before the firing. And then um, the next shade here, the next color here is, um, it's almost that, um, it's more like a light yellow. And then the, um, the orange there is, um, it's prettier and um, a more bright orange before the firing, but after the firing it turns that color. But some of the colors do change, especially the, the, the colors. And then um, as Amanda found out on um, one of her pots there, she went and found out that that, um, that really, that the paint that she found didn't fire what she, uh, the, sh the color or the shape that she thought it would come out. The colors changed. And so Amanda's kind of your protege in a lot of ways. And so <laughs> what designs are you most impressed with what Amanda does? I think I really, um, I don't know. Sometimes she like, um, with the most um, recent plate that she did, that was something, sometimes she, she, she's gone off on her own to try to come up with different designs, patterns. Um, she she tried to do a lot of the, the designs that I do, and um, she said, 
Um, it's not coming out right. It's not coming out even. I said, it's your work, your design. You paint it the way you want to do it because that's Amanda's pot. That's her Amanda's design. So sometimes I would section it off for her and everything, and then she'll go and look at it, and she'll come up with a, a pattern or a design, and and then she goes, Mom, look how it came out. It came out, and she's always, um, I, I think she surprises herself a lot of times of the way that the, her pots come out, and she's gotten more patient. Well, that's good. That's her, that so, comes with time. Yes. And because she would, you know, want to, and even her, her pots, when she makes them, she would, um, she uh, would get frustrated. Um, and she would say, I can't do this. Or I don't know what to do. I don't know how to paint this. And I, sometimes I just don't say anything to her. I think she already knows what I'm going to tell her. <laughs> <laughs> but well, she's come a long way. It is true. I, I believe it is true in the Native American community. Uh, the way that you teach is by doing mm -hmm. and letting whoever is learning by watching mm -hmm. rather than by instructing mm -hmm. via words. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it, it's kind of like, you know, you watch for years and years until, mm -hmm. you know, you can then, you, and then, until you can then begin on your own. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that's the, the, the plate back there. That's the one she really worked hard on. And well, I there was were two surprised this that morning that you guys just brought in, yes. and one has already found a new home this, oh, today. Oh, goodness. Good. So that's really good for uh -huh. uh, Amanda, which is quite wonderful. Mm -hmm. But I think the one that Rebecca was pointing to was this one right yes. here. Mm -hmm. She put in the feather pattern. That's the feather pattern around here. And then she's got the, the North Star in there. And then the orange right there. You have your um, sun pattern on there. And then the little checkers represent the fields, but she's got all that. But I like the way she left that word, that, that white just brings it out, um, which she's never done before. And um, with her work, with that kind of detail. So I told her that, you know, I think that's really, you know, uh, something different. Yeah, and also what I'm noticing in this piece is there's an area here that mm -hmm. all of the, the squares are all filled in black. Mm -hmm. There's a, in this area, there's a few squares that have the fine lines in them. Yes. And there's an area where there's a, where it's mostly fine lines. Mm -hmm. And then it goes back towards yes. the few squares mm -hmm. and then it goes back towards uh, yes. completely mm -hmm. full. Sure. Um, which I think is really fun as well. Mm -hmm. And she also seems to do that as well on this plate mm -hmm. with the different designs which are right. inside the snowflake. And I'm yes. just going to hold this mm -hmm. up to the camera here. Yes. Yes, so she's there. I've done a lot of, um, you know, um, creating on her own and uh, done a lot of work. And a few questions. When you, um, you obviously do, you're human and you do make mistakes when you're painting things and you erase them. Do you find mistakes after the piece is finished? No, sometimes, sometimes you will, but sometimes um, you can't tell until um, um or when you're painting you know you made a mistake but you're in a hurry to finish it so you say okay i'll go back and fix it later so sometimes we wait till we're completely done then we go back and um, erase our mistakes or if it's a big major mistake you can't you know fix it after you're done painting so you have to scrape that whole area reapply the white slip if necessary and then paint over it um, I do know some potters uh, actually purposefully design in some sort of mistake. Um, yes. Do you ever do that with your pieces? Sometimes, like um, in the middle of a pot, um, I'll put, um, sometimes I'll deliberately not fill all of it in. Um, there was a jar that I did, I can't remember where it was. And then, or you'll um, leave um, lines. Um, on a pot and then uh, not erase the mistake on it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, um, and does, does that sometimes have special meaning or what's the, you know, the idea behind it? Because, um, I mean, I have seen many artists do that where they leave some sort <laughs> of inconsistency on there on purpose. And I, I do know from San Alfonso yeah. Potters uh -huh. uh, in about the late 1800s, uh -huh. Sometimes that mistake was that person's signature uh, prior yes, to the days yes, of signature. Yes, I've seen that even in some of on the the pots. 
thou actually deliberately let the pun paint to run the orange paint that's mm -hmm. on the inside, they'll let it run mm -hmm. on, on the inside. And that, that was it because a lot of the pots weren't signed mm -hmm. uh, back in the days. But now, you know, we have our, our trademark. Mm -hmm. Mine is, Amanda's is a corn. Mine has a, a coca pili. And my sisters have their own. Like, Marilyn has a lizard. And I think <laughs> Diane or some of the, one of them have, has a fish. That uh, Diane. So um, we all have our own. So that you know that because I've seen some of my pots where uh, I didn't have that. It was just my name, but it didn't have the trademark on there, you know, so. Um, and also, um, you know, these signatures is something that is relatively new in the whole big scheme of things. Mm -hmm. um, did your grandma sign her pots? She signed her pots. It was um, hers were uh, Dolores S. Sanchez because there's another Dolores Sanchez. Mm -hmm. at Athema, but hers was Dolores S. Sanchez. So and, but before, I mean, before, obviously, nobody signed their pots. No, um, not her. I have one of my great grandmother's pottery, and it's not signed. Mm -hmm. They're not signed at all. Yep. Um, so what I'm trying to ask is uh, the the change from the, the days of no signatures mm -hmm. to the days of signatures. Mm -hmm. Was that a big change philosophically, kind of within the pueblo, or was that you know it would just kind of happen? And you know, everybody's now kind of expected to sign their work, or how did that kind of happen or come about? I think it came about because a lot of the people were, um, uh, they wanted me to know who the artist was. And then, and then it was like, um, um, in the old days, the, the, the women knew who, who made certain pots. They would say, oh, that's so-and-so because she always leaves, the pots are thick when you feel it. Mm -hmm. She leaves them thick uh, around the top, or they will say on the bottom she'll leave a thumbprint, or she'll leave um, paint running on the inside of her pot. Uh, and some of them actually left indentions in the inside of the pot or on the bottom. But I think a lot of people started when they started asking um, who the the artist was and. and they said, well, you should sign your name to it. A lot of people, tourists will come by and say, that way I'll remember who, who I bought the pot from. Mm -hmm. So people started signing their names to the pots. Well, that's really cool. I mean, the, the idea that before there was no signatures and mm -hmm. there was a change culturally mm -hmm. and it was adapted to and mm -hmm. pretty widely accepted mm -hmm. is something that's kind of interesting and hopefully uh, we can learn from the past and hopefully we can make changes to adapt to the future. Yes, and then I, I noticed on some of the old pots too, they just put their initials on there so it could be anybody. <laughs> yeah, well it could be anybody, but you know, mm -hmm. it's not. So Rebecca, of all the pieces that are up here, what is your favorite, what was your favorite one to paint? Um, I think my favorite ones are the plates. I like doing the plates because it's easy to carry and you can um, see how the design's gonna come out. But with, um, I don't know, the seed pots to me, they're, they're okay, they're like the plates, but the, the jars are pretty challenging because they, like I said, you have to go with the shape so they don't always come out the same. Um, you know, the pattern kind of shifts because it's not, it's not very even, I mean, all the way around. Um, there's always, you know, it's either lopsided or thin or thick or some places, and um, it's it's kind of hard to um, to um, get that um, the the pattern on there because it's not even. So even if you did make the marks at the top uh, and bring it down, one side's going to be wider than the other because it might be sticking out on one side. Mm -hmm. So um, you just kind of have to like move your move your design to fit the pot. Well, thank you, Rebecca. This has been very, very enlightening. And, you know, it's, it's a pleasure to have you here. And I'm so glad that you, both you and Amanda are here. And that, uh, you know, we're all masked up in here because we all want to care for each other and make sure that we, uh, we, we do the right thing and we follow the rules of the state. And hopefully we're doing well by your governor and trying to keep everybody well. 
and uh, you know we're we're here trying to support all the artists over Indian market. Uh, even though the, the the actual Indian market on the plaza is not taking place, they're doing some sort of virtual thing, yes. and mm -hmm. I wish them all success in that. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, uh, you know, this will be very successful uh, for you in the future because you are an incredible talent, and we've had many many comments today about how much you are a national treasure. So you know, hooray, Thank go you. Rebecca! <laughs> it's kind of cool. <laughs> Okay. So, anyway, uh, if you want to just head back over, and okay. we'll go back over to Amanda, who's been painting away patiently. Maybe she's almost done. Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe I can show you some of the paints. Oh, we should have brought one of the jars over so we, we could Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll bring one over okay. for you. We have a message, though, from someone really special. Yeah. Derek, would you mind reading it? Give me... A couple moments, and yes, okay. absolutely. Okay, we'll get all set up here again, and then we'll be able to talk about all the stuff that you brought, and uh, and we'll get um, we'll get to hear the message because it's a real special one. It would just take me a moment to set up the cameras again. Rebecca, getting a little tired. No, not really. I guess no, I'm used you're to not it. tired of us. <laughs> <laughs> you should be. <laughs> She can finish it today. Oh no, I don't think so, do you? Not a chance. Are you starting to fill in the little diamonds? Mm, I am. He's not ready. He's not ready, ready yet. yet. Mm. Get in here. Get in here. Let's have that special message. And then, Rebecca, you can tell us So about the special it. message is from Judy Lewis. <laughs> Judy says, love this, my big sister, my inspiration. Aww. Aww. <laughs> I love you, Judy. <laughs> Judy is Rebecca's sister, obviously. Judy's sister. And uh, she is going to be demonstrating here. I will, let me look it up on the schedule. Along with Diane who is another one of Rebecca's um, sisters, and the two of them will be here on the 27th, which is a Thursday, uh, and both Diane and Judy will be here demonstrating. We just couldn't have those girls all in the same place at one time. <laughs> Otherwise, we'd be asking for big trouble. <laughs> and uh, it'll, be really, it'll be really fun to see them and, and their work. But, Rebecca, you were going to tell us a little bit about what you have, what you brought, and all those various yes, containers. I brought my tools. Well, I'll start with the clay. This is what the clay looks like when it comes out of the ground. And you soak it, and it will just break down. It looks hard as a rock. Yes, it is. And then um, when you soak it, it will just crumble like this one here. And uh, we have to um, soak this. I soak it twice. <gasps> ah! Sorry. <laughs> but you can, um, it's, it, it'll crumble. And that's how that, we can string that one. But that's how that one comes out. I will string it. Through. That's okay. 
but um, we have, um, that's what the clay looks like. These are the, the ground up pottery shirts that we uh, I use a real fine screen after I grind it, and that's what we add to the clay. I, I why, don't. Um, um, why do you add pottery shirts? Um, I always add a little. Right now, um, the clay, um, you don't really need to add shards the way you did a long time ago, especially the large pots. If you add too much of the shards, the, the pots will crack. When you're making them, it just forms a lot of these cracks on the bottom of the pots. And it's hard to, to scrape. So personally, I don't add too much of the shards unless I'm making a real large now, one. Do you call the shards, a stabilizer. Yeah, do you yeah. call the shards temper? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can use so, it as temper, yes. And so temper so, is kind of like a glue yeah. that keeps the clay from falling apart. Okay. Sorry. And oh, also keeps it, mu and it makes it much lighter, so that when we carry that heavy water around, um, that uh, it makes so it, oh, this is what happens sometimes. I'm what happens? <clears throat> I have to take off the whole design. The whole design? Why? I ended up with two lines at the bottom, and I have three lines at the top. So it's not going to come out even. <laughs> Can you adjust somehow? Mm -mm. The lines aren't going to be even. <sighs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Don't you take the whole thing off? Mm -hmm. Isn't there something you can do to, to save it? I wish. <laughs> nope. <laughs> That's just part of what happens. It's just like I was explaining to Derek, sometimes you have to erase the whole thing. Oh. I didn't and she was almost done lining it. I don't, I don't understand. What, show us what the, the problem is. Explain it. Here, hold on. Yeah. I'm going to set the camera in a really good spot. Hold on. Okay. okay. All right. So what's going on here? Okay, so see how I bring the lines down? Uh-huh. I have two more to close it up right here, right? Yeah. But on the top, I have three lines. That you have three lines. So you even if I try to put in that other, it's not going to work. Can you put some of some completely different design in there, like um, you flowers? <laughs> really, I'm serious. Could you put some? Or snowflakes? Or yeah, yeah. Or repaint it, I guess. Or just leave it that way, just leave that part and then do the, um, almost like that lifeline thing, just to erase it. Yeah, and then, and then do, and then a, maybe a do that on the other maybe side too. Maybe just lines. Yeah, just maybe lines. Just, just lines uh, rather than erasing the whole thing. I saw it. Also. Well, you know, Thomas Tenorio was here on, third, <laughs> on last Wednesday and so I asked lines. him about how, what does he do if he makes a mistake? Mm -hmm. He said he can't take the paint off. Yes. And so that splotch all of a sudden becomes a flower petal <laughs> or a leaf. Uh, but he just changes the design a little. Yeah. And you know, maybe, maybe hey, hey, Amanda, this maybe this is the time for you to uh, conjure up some We're completely new design. Yeah. Yeah. Pattern. Yeah. And a new pattern. And, that, uh, and with sometimes with it, and it's worse if you're done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> designing it and you're filling in, and when you come to the other side and it's like, why is it not coming out? <laughs> no. And I'm like, no. oh, there goes six weeks. I've done that yeah. Before. Yeah. Well, you yeah. know, maybe you do something to make it look intentional. I guess she didn't want to be like that. <laughs> well, I, that's also part of it. My grandma used to tell me that like people, pottery are all different. They all have their mm -hmm. own personalities. Yeah, just think about the, this. The, the personality <laughs> of this pod is someone who is obstinate or ornery. Mm -hmm. yeah, she used to tell me when I made it. When that happened to me, she would say, Where are you women? No, yeah, you. I guess it just was, you know, wants to be that way. 
He wants to be that. And how do you say it? And, and curious, it wants to be that way. You went and they create you. Yeah. Oh, we we're going to do the, the, the paint. Yeah, and then yeah. Show us all the rest bring of that, bring that a pot. Uh, can you bring that pot that has the different colors in it? Yeah. So I can show the colors. Okay. Anyway, that was the clay, the shards. And then the tools, I'll do the tools because we're talking about the pottery. I brought some of my tools that I use. This is the, the one you were looking for? Yes. Okay. Um, let me do the um, okay. tools first. These sure. are my tools. Um, I have wooden tools, I have coconut tools, I have board tools, and a pottery tool. Oh, and you have metal tool. You have a metal tool also. Yes, I have uh -huh, my famous, chewing tobacco. Uh, this is worth millions. <laughs> my skullet that I used to scrape the clay off of my pots. And of course, I have my corn beef lids that I also use and those are my tools that's what I use when I'm making and shaping my pottery all those tools are all for making and tools. shaping mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this is real good for the plates when I'm shaping the plates so this is what I used to shape my plates with now the colors you can bring the plate now and I will show you what these colors look like okay the colors that you see on the outside here is this paint. Okay. Huh. So it will change color after um, it's a uh, fire. So this is the red color. And this is a bowl that Iris <laughs> did when she was like about four. Wow. So I use her pot. <laughs> okay, this color is almost the same color as this, the little squares, comes from this, this paint here. Now this paint here, this real bright orange one, is the color that it will turn, this, it will turn that shade of orange there. Okay, I will show it. Come on, the same color, but it's, it changes color too. So that's where we get our colors from. Some of them are bright orange, but they um, turn a lighter orange after they're fired. So it depends on where you get the clay, the paints. And Amanda found um, lavender colors that looked pink before they were fired. Mm. So that's where we get it. And then the more darker, uh, the more red your pink is, so you can see it turns a darker. Sometimes it's real black. Um, so if your pink is, uh, the more red your pink is, the uh, more darker, uh, more of a black color you'll get. So you can see the color of the pink. And then after you fire it, it changes a darker color. How, it's rare that you use all three colors on the piece, isn't it? For me, yes. Mm -hmm. But that's what I, I do. Those are the paints that I use. And then this is that white slip. This is the white slip that we apply to the pot. And then like this one is ready to paint. And I used this rock to, to polish it. We put the, uh, uh, a thin um, uh, uh, white slip to it, and then we use a polishing rock. Get it smooth, rub it on your hands, and it's ready to paint. So that's how those are done. But it's not something that you can do in two hours. <laughs> so all that takes time. Or even two days. No. I can make like about, if I sit down to make I have my clay ready, and so I'll sit down and start making and I can make up to maybe 10 seed pots in one day. 
but I'll, it'll be the next day when they're completely done because I still have to scrape them and smooth them out. And this is the rock that I used to um, smooth out my um, the, uh, the pots with after I scraped them with my school lid. So this is the rock I used to put, put dip it in water and I just smoothed out my pottery. Where'd you get, where'd you get that rock? Um, I don't know, it was my grandmother's. <laughs> well, so. I've heard people say that polishing stones are like box seats at the San Francisco Opera. <laughs> you inherit them. You can buy them, you inherit them. Yes, this one um, my grandmother had a long time, but I bought this at, uh, at the store. I don't remember which store it was, but I saw it as, hey, nice polishing stones, so I bought it. And then I have some that my grandmother had that um, she gave me, it's black, and it's not that smooth, but it's shiny in some places, and that's what she used to, to shine her pots with. Yeah, Tina Garcia told me once that she had polishing stones that she got from her grandmother, mm -hmm. and her four-year-old ate them. <gasps> <laughs> well, luckily, yeah. luckily, she didn't have to go to the emergency room, but she yeah. did get them back. <laughs> so that was good. Um, I have to keep Marilyn's daughter away from my clay. She eats my clay, uh -huh. and so does Amanda. <laughs> They like the taste of the clay and they'll eat it. Well, I know uh, Derek's dog Stout, who once in a while gets in the camera. <laughs> I've seen him lick a few pots the last uh, week or so. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think I brought everything, and then I did show you the the raw, um, the white before um, it's soaked, and um, this is that white. And you have to soak it and then um, strain it with um, a cloth. So this is what it looks like. It's hard, but it breaks down like the clay. And then I strain it and it's in the white comes through. Now there is some white slip that it's not, you can't use it as a slip because it doesn't polish like the, um, the, the white slip. Though. It, um, the whole um, white slip, um, just flakes off the pot, then you know it's not that good, um, the white slip. And uh, instead of wasting it, I found that in, I just go ahead and um, mix it into my, my new clay. And then when I'm ready to put the white slip on, I just put a thin slip on there because then it fires white. I don't have to use a lot of the white slip. One of the potters who demonstrated last week said that if he, lets his clay age mm -hmm. for a couple months, mm -hmm. that it's much more elastic and much easier to use yes. um, than mm -hmm. if it's, you know, brand new. Yes, uh, I found that out because I would save, like, you know, the, um, uh, like last year, uh, during the winter, it's too cold to make, uh, and the pots crack or they freeze, so, um, during the summer months, I'll have some clay sitting there, and when it warms up, then it, that's what I found out was that it's easier to work with. So, so I if believe it freezes that's a true. little, it's easier. So you and could. So in August, you could stick it in your freezer, <laughs> in, your, in your refrigerator, and pretend like it's snowing outside, right. and then take it out and use it. Yeah, but um, I, I have, um, I noticed that that it is a lot easier. So sometimes I'll just make, make a little bit of clay and then just leave it and then um, start working with it. But we've, we've tried everything. Um, a lot of things, some, sometimes we can even like, um, uh, like the seed pots, I found that it's easier just to put two like bowls, plates together to make the seed pot. But the round ones, you make like a bottom part like this one, if this was going to be a seat pot, we'll bring it up, then I would have to get my tool, which would be this, and I will shape it, make it like a bowl, then I put it on top, then I use this one here, and I press the clay down to seal it, to, to make that um, the, the seat pot, and then I'll just put a bowl on the top, and that's how some of the seat pots are made, the round ones that come up.
Whose pod is that? This one? Yeah. I have no idea. It doesn't have a name. It doesn't have a name? Have you had a long time? Yeah. Yeah? It doesn't quite compare to the work that you do. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. But that's how I used to design my pottery when uh -huh. I first got started. And it, lo it looks rather pinky in mm -hmm. color. Could that be commercial clay? No, I think it's from the uh, from having the paint in there. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. Yes, there is the uh, the paint, uh, pink color, that, but it's not all. I majority of them, yes, I can say that it is um, like uh, the the pots if they're kind of pink. It's for, it's called um, it's called. Um, what was it called? Storyteller story clay. Color clay. It does fire pink like that. Yeah. And even if you put like that white slip on, it still comes through. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. yeah. I've seen that. That was my grandmother's favorite design to paint. <gasps> That's yeah. grandma's pottery. We thought you might like seeing that, Rebecca. <laughs> she was my mom. She always called me her daughter. That's her favorite design. I thought you'd like seeing that, Rebecca. I can't believe that you get to call her first. Yeah, she did all her pots, fired them up doors. You can tell by the color. Thank you so much for showing me. No problem. She'll be right here watching. Yeah, she's going to be watching you. So, you know, she knows that you're doing it right, Rebecca. Yeah, that was her favorite design. Do you ever do that design? Yes, I've done that design uh -huh. before I just started doing the other, other pots. But that's how I. And, then, the one what, that and so, what did that. you do? Did you start washing your designs and they all shrunk? <laughs> <laughs> I left them in the fire too long. Yeah, and they just all shrunk up uh, to uh, tiny ones. But yeah. we thought, you know, you might like seeing uh, your mama's pots. I can't believe that. I have one of her thinking. I have one of her vases. I guess I should have brought a, a vase that she did. That, that was one of her last pieces because she ended up with Parkinson's disease and mm. she couldn't paint anymore, so she just quit making and painting. How old did she live to be? A um, hundred and... What? what? Just on her, I can't remember. 102? 102. She lived to be 102. Do you plan on living that long, too? Oh, gosh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> With the way things are going on, I don't think so. <laughs> it was really lucky to get through the day, right? <laughs> <laughs> the day, but I just got the day. It was so yeah. great. She's 102, mm -hmm. which is yeah. really quite amazing because, yeah. you know, she lived through the Spanish flu. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of medical care was it at the moment? There wasn't. Well, she used to tell me about when she was, um, she was up here in, um, I guess what's now St. Catharines, or I don't know if that school even St. exists St. Catharines Indian School, yeah. yes. It was, she went to school there because she told me it was a school for orphans. And when her, um, when her parents, uh, my, her, her grandmother, I mean, uh, my great-grandmother died, they sent um, her up here with her some of her siblings, and she said that they were um, talking about, um, uh, they didn't know what an airplane was, so they used to call them fly machine. And um, she said that she was already um, a full grown woman, and um, she, would, she took care of the, the little ones, the younger ones that were there. But uh, it was my grandfather who taught her how to mix the dough. He was a baker. 
So he baked, um, he would mix the dough at the school and um, they would uh, uh, bake. So when they came home, my um, that's where my grandparents met. And then he uh, he's the one that taught my grandmother how to make bread. So well, I like to bake bread. My grandmother's the one that taught me how to bake bread. Oh gosh, I can't believe that. I can't believe that. That pop. You said that was her favorite design. She always painted that design on there. Well, yeah. this just came in this week. Really? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh my goodness. She magically goodness. showed up in the mail. Oh my goodness. How did she know I was going to be here? <laughs> <laughs> She was, I don't have a picture of her. Well, I do at home, but I'll send you a picture that was from my grandmother. Yeah, take she, a picture when your your granddaughter mm -hmm. teaches you how to use the camera on your phone. Yeah. You should always know to do it. Take mm -hmm. a picture yeah. of the picture of her. Uh-huh. But she was, she was the one who taught me how to, how to make it. She used to be so upset if the Pop, when we started the fire outside, it would start popping, and she would just walk away. And then she said, I don't want to see which one it was that popped. Yeah. And then we go outside, take off all the ashes and everything, and she would say, nope, it wasn't the one that I thought. Wow. Well, also, you know, if you really don't worry about air bubbles, they can pop and take out the ones around them as well, so they can all break in the fire. Where did that pop come from? I don't know. Hmm. You don't know who, who, who purchased I, I don't, that? I don't know who purchased it. It is in here on consignment. Where, did you know where the people live? We can look it up. I can look it up for you, Rebecca. Yeah, we can look it up. I'll look it up for you after the show. Where it's on consignment? Yep. Take a picture of it. Oh, okay, yeah, well, 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 you can take as many pictures as you want. Mm -hmm. How much is it going for? Huh. There might be. Yeah, is there, are the wheels turning yes. in your head and I you're thinking about maybe trading yes. something? Yes. We trade here. Yes. I will because you know what? It really is. It, yeah. yeah. It belongs here. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Absolutely. see how black her paint was? Yeah. yeah. She's really the one that told me. She said, you have to. She, I would try to make the paint black. And she goes, no, it's going to fire brown. She oh. would tell me that. Yeah, and, and you said, do no, see it's not. you you do see some mm -hmm. brownish colors yes. from some people uh -huh. at Akama. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then she used to tell me she goes, "Don't put too much orange; it's gonna peel." She used to tell me that. Yep, you can tell just by feeling. Just by feeling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even the the. <laughs> so what did you now say? What, tell us what you told her. And <laughs> when she scraped, she left a piece of the scraper. Sometimes that what happens to me. But you you're it. scraping, it's on there. She yeah. left yeah. it in there. It's stuck to the side and it doesn't come off even after the fire. Yeah. Well, I, I've also seen pots with a glurch at the bottom because the painter yeah. Off the brush, and there's no way to take it off. Yeah. Or you can't even see the, the, the painted. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what happened to one of my pottery, but Mila, huh? She painted the inside black. Mm -hmm. She painted <laughs> holes inside of her mom's pot. I was like, really? Yeah. <laughs> and she tried to put white slip over it, that black just kept coming through. Uh -huh. I, I can't believe that. There was a pot, too, that she has. I'll send you a picture of it. It's a vase. It's the only base I have. And then I had a real that I, I, I just, I don't want to get really upset because I think, I think Dwayne might have sold my real old pot. 
It was a small pot. It, it was about this big. It had um, um, an eagle and a deer design. Mm -hmm. It was made by my grandmother's brother. Made and painted by my grandmother's brother. Mm -hmm. And it was very old. And I think when he was really starting to drink really heavily, I think he sold it. Because mm -hmm. I, I missed it around that time. It was about five or six years ago that I lost that pot. But I had that pot and my grandmother gave it to me. But I can't believe it. That's the first thing I said. Grandma's design. That's grandma's design. Yeah. yeah. That's just grandma's design. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. So let me add what you did. I just you polished it back up. Yeah. Just just something out. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see. Look at that. That ring pattern. Yeah. It takes forever. I know. <laughs> Maybe that's what it wants to I be. I guess. Um, mm -hmm. Rain. Um, well, yeah. make it rain. <laughs> <laughs> make me need rain. And isn't it, it better to um, to take the time to do the rain than to scrape mm -hmm. everything off and start all over again? Yeah. Let's see how it's going. That's what sometimes we do. Oh my God. I can't believe I have to. Sometimes it's so frustrating. You just break it back up and start all over again. Oh. Yeah, it'll work. Yeah. So, Mindy, you never answered my question about what? what you do for fun. I mean, there, there, it, it's going to revert back to what you know, what we used to do. <laughs> <laughs> and mm -hmm. so, we would, and and uh, so, what did you do be, for fun before this pandemic started? Work. work. <laughs> yeah, I was actually. Um, still working at the culture center, but like I said, because of the whole pandemic thing, I shut down. And I went back on furlough, so I just started doing the pottery again. And then she would hang out with Iris. She would come into town. Was it Iris? Yeah, does Iris live in the Pueblo? No, no, she lives in Albuquerque. She lives in Albuquerque. Yeah. So you don't get to see her very much, do you? Mm -hmm. Nope. Oh dear. Nope, not at all. Not while you're imprisoned in lockdown. Yeah. Oh, gosh, it's coming up. Okay. I'm getting full. Yes, you just don't go anywhere or do anything. Yeah, so I just like I said, stay home. Stay home and paint. Or take my daughter for a walk. Play with her. I was telling her she knows how to find the paint the rock. Oh, I know. <laughs> she knows how to find paint the paint too. rock. She'll grab one and she'll be scratching it. She'll be like, nope, mom, it's not paint. She'll throw it. Little <laughs> <laughs> oh, monkey. So you make all your pieces the, the traditional way. What? You make all your pieces the traditional way. Do you, how do you start them? Do you start them in a pokey? Or... Um, do you, um, you know, roll if up? It's a, if it's a large pot, we use, um, we use a base form. Uh-huh. Um, this is one of them for the large pots. And then, um, I usually start out on this one. I just set it, put the clay pot in, the, in there, and then we, uh, put coils on there. Mm -hmm. But if it's going to be a large pot, then we use the bigger ones, this uh, size here. Uh -huh. And um, when they're ready to be scraped because they come down at the bottom of the base, then we just use this one. Yeah. And we set the pots on there and then wait for it to dry. And then you can, um, and you know when it's time to scrape because when you start scraping, it doesn't, um, it just scrapes right off real easily. Uh -huh. But if not, the, the um, scraper gets stuck in the clay. It's drag. Yes. Yeah. So you have to wait till it dries a little. Well, that, that cookie prevents the pot from um, sticking mm -hmm. to whatever you are working mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. And you can move it around there yes. easily. Mm -hmm. And also you can turn it around mm -hmm. to make sure that, you know, it doesn't look like the Leaning Tower yes. of Pisa. <laughs> Yes, we, um, that's what we use, and then um, when they're done, then we turn them upside down, and we do the, the bottom, 
we scrape off some of the clay from the bottom. Mm -hmm. but, um, it's usually that's where it's usually heavy because you can't tell how thick or how thin it is on the bottom. And does it does the clay is the weight of the clay that you're building up on top of the bottom? Does that push the bot? Does that make the bottom denser? Um, I I think so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, but um, it's that it if. I think it's more difficult on the real large pots mm -hmm. because um, that's where it's hard to, to view like the pot above you. That, that's a large pot. Mm -hmm. And um, so what we do, what I do is I make it as thin as I can on the bottom. But you also have to be careful you don't make it too thin mm -hmm. because when you start building it up, then it falls in it at the bottom. Out. Yes. Yeah. So, so if, if you... Uh, made a hundred pots, how many of them would go all the way to the end where you could tell them that they made it through the building, the drying, the polishing, the slipping, the painting, and the firing? And so, you know, what sort of percentage would that be that, you know, if you had a hundred pots, how many would be, survive? Okay, um, you would get maybe about 95 out of 100 95. if they um, um if you can fire them that the, since the last step is the firing that's where you know you just hope and pray that they don't crack break pot or anything because um especially with the large pots the small pots you can get most of them out most of them will come out because the, the, the uh, packing is not as difficult as I'm um, trying to pack the clay for the large pots. We have an interesting question for you, Rebecca, hmm. from Dan from San Diego. And Dan says, I have pottery from all five sisters and also sister-in-law Sharon and Eva. His house must be full of giggles then. Don't I guess so. I think <laughs> so. All have butterflies as part of the design. Mm -hmm. This was not an accident. My wife and I are insect scientists, and much of our, our Pueblo pottery collection involves insect designs. I have an extra can of Ray if he needs it. Uh, his question is, why butterflies? Is it economic? Do they sell well? Is that why people put butterflies on their pots? Or is there some cultural significance of butterflies to the Akama people? For our people, it represents beauty and freedom. Beauty and freedom, mm -hmm. huh? Boy, we could just yeah. use a whole bunch of butterflies. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, wouldn't that be nice? So, mm -hmm. And is this a tradition that's carried on forever and ever? Um, yes, so that's what my grandmother used, used to tell us, but she always used to caution us too, you don't give a child a butterfly because they don't talk, because butterflies don't talk. Oh. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, my butterflies talk. I don't know they don't sing. Oh, yeah, she used too. to tell us, never give a, a child, uh, uh, especially if they haven't started talking, so never give a child a butterfly. Because then the child won't mm -hmm. talk? Mm -hmm. Huh. They won't talk yeah. early. Since, but since Dan and his uh, wife are insect scientists, uh, other insects appear on Akama pots. Mm -hmm. The I've members. Seen mm -hmm. those butter, yeah, the members mm -hmm. one. I've mm -hmm. seen a butterfly moth with a curly, right. uh -huh. with a curly beak. Right. And, uh, do any other insects have um, cultural significance? Insects? Insects. Um, no, just, um, just the, 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 the butter, um, uh, ladybug. Yeah, I see ladybugs. Good luck. Good luck? Mm-hmm. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I wonder if they were originally called flutterbys. They flutter when they go by. I don't know. Whether someone just got kind of mixed up one day and they've been butterflies ever since. Yes. 
I don't think they're attracted to butter. <laughs> they like my butter. They like my butterfly bush in the backyard with all the purple flowers. <laughs> yeah. So, but ladybugs mm-hmm. are good luck, mm-hmm. and butterflies are freedom. beauty and freedom. Beauty and freedom. Boy, that's really perfect, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Well, Dan, I hope that answers your question. I, I'm curious as what what an entomologist uh, does. I mean, do you look for new species, or do you look for migratory patterns, or do you count them to see which ones are thriving and which ones are croaking, so to speak? (laughs) And uh, it would be really nice to know, and maybe after some of this is over, Dan, we can have a little entomology discussion. (laughs) But, uh, yeah, and... uh, this is uh, this is really you know been a, a really wonderful <laughs> afternoon. I can't thank you guys enough for, for doing all this. Uh, and uh, Amanda, do you think? Uh, well, can I? I mean, I can't see what you're doing, but I'm actually going the other way on the pot. You're going the other way? Yeah, I'm doing the lines the uh-huh. other way, so it's getting. The checkers, the squares. Uh huh. Yeah. And and I like the racing stripe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna just do a big stick of orange. <laughs> Two pink little dots like ladybugs and the yeah, wheels yeah. on them. That's the race track. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just draw another line down the middle of the road. <laughs> 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 Then so put I-40. I-40. <laughs> I'm going to sign right here. <laughs> really, um, okay, I'll have some more plates. Yeah, what happened to your leg? I think you got quite over there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, do you want to go with Derek and, or me and talk a little bit about some of your plants that are on display? Yeah, sure. All right, so I'm over here with Amanda right now with some of her pieces, and maybe you can tell me a little bit about this design here because I really like the combination of the orange and the, and the fine lines on this one. Oh, right I just tried something different. <laughs> like I said, I always try to do something a little different. So this one just has the um, orange that represents the sun, and then the lines represent the rain and the clouds, and then the mountains right here, and then the cornfields. So yeah, I just thought I'd throw in some color to see how it came out, and I like it too. Came out different. Yeah, and yeah. then there's this one which I noticed has a combination. Oh yeah. <laughs> of com- where it's completely yeah. filled in, where it has a few with fine lines, where mm-hmm. it has a lot with fine lines. Mm-hmm. And w- what were you going for here? I again just trying to um, do something a little different. So I. I already know like how many squares there are, so in my head I was like, okay, I can at least incorporate, you know, what, three different patterns on here and rows of four, so that's, you know, so it's like, okay, so that's how I did it, and I was actually going to just all do it black, but then I was like, I wonder, let's try it out, so I went ahead and did actually took the design from this plate with the lines in the middle and the snowflake pattern I did it onto the checker pattern so it's kind of tried something different so I'm new I like the feathers in the center yeah, yeah it's just I really never gorgeous never painted that in a while so just thought they're I'd try really, it out they're really delicate <laughs> now yeah. this little jar is really different than all the rest yeah. what's, what's happening here uh, this one I just wanted to 
explore a little bit more. Again, I did do the um, do the um, lines in the middle, the squares, different patterns. So if you look at it, there's like there's all rolls of black, and then there's the ones around the big squares that have lines in them. So I just like to play around with the designs. I try to try something new all the time. And these seed pots, I think they're really interesting. Yeah, these ones. This one is just the, has your fine lines in there and then your feather pattern. And then I threw a little color in there, the orange. This but, one don't have the orange in there, it just has the black. So. But the feathers look so different. Let me grab that other plate again. Yeah. They're so they're, different than the The uh, straight. Yeah. Yeah. And then those ones have the curve in them. Yeah. So I just try it different ways. Like I said, I'm always trying, trying different ways of different patterns and stuff. So this is another way to paint them. You'll also see sometimes on the feather pattern too, they'll have an extra line underneath the design. The black, there'll be an extra line there too. So great. Yeah. Now your your mom does some of these membrane designs where she paints. And by the way, the Membres people lived in southern New Mexico, mm -hmm. and it is believed that the people from Acoma are the descendants of the, the Membres people, and they uh, did a, almost exclusively black and white yeah. pots. They didn't know anything at all about <laughs> all this Technicolor, yeah. and, um, and they did lots and lots of animal designs mm -hmm. and and I noticed that uh, there are lots of animal designs on your mama's pots yeah but uh, you do you do those also it's so strange a lot of people ask me that like if, if I do members for I can't even draw a fish <laughs> oh I, I that's hard <laughs> it to look like a guppy or something <laughs> I can I even a lizard I tried it I'm like nope just the piece that I had that one that um was here with the um, the little dancers on there as, as close to members as I can get. Uh, <laughs> I can't job do the animals I tried and I'm just like, no, oh, that's not my thing. <laughs> well, the so. geometric designs are really, really beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I find this easier than painting the members. So I stick to this, <laughs> this style. Well, now, um, tell me about this. I mean, I don't know if you know about any of these animals. I can, I can sort of uh, have an idea. I mean, the one with the top knot. Let's see if we can move in a little closer here. The one yeah, with the one... top knot is a quail. Yeah, that's a quail. And then you got a turkey, a uh, roadrunner. And a crane. Oh, it's a crane. Yeah. I love the way um, your Aunt Carolyn yeah. uh, pictures I like the, way the she cranes. Did. Yeah. Because she always having, has them eating fish, but they, the <laughs> fish aren't going down their throats. The yeah. fish are sticking out sticking in out the other mouth. direction. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and we'll see some of her stuff coming up. And yeah. then there are even more animals here. Um, do all of these animals have some sort of um, religious or natural meaning within your culture? Oh. Like you said that the butterfly was uh, beauty and and, uh, and and freedom. Freedom, yeah. And uh, the ladybug was good luck. Mm -hmm. What about do the does the fish have any special meaning? Was that? I wouldn't know. I'm, I like, I'm not too familiar with... Where, where do people go fishing at Akama? There isn't water. I know, that's what... You know, I used to ask my mom that, like... Because even in our language, like, there's certain words, like, for whale and, you know... For fish. whale? Yeah, and I'm like, what? There's no... We don't, we don't live near our ocean. We live in the desert. Like, how did they come up with those kinds of words? Well, so it, that just always mind boggled me. But, yeah, the rabbit... Fish, lizard, that's a caterpillar. I Ooh, know that's there we go. Yeah. Oh, Rebecca, there's a caterpillar. That's another insect. Does it have a special meaning? 
Yeah, Kyle the Pillar. Does, yeah. Does a cat... No, caterpillar doesn't. It's just the beginnings of a butterfly, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then the turtles. Um, what was the turtles, Mom? Huh? Turtle? Longevity. 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 Well, you know, I've heard from other native people that say the turtle is like Noah. And huh. because the turtle can live in the water and on the land. Mm -hmm. And when the great flood came, which apparently affected the whole earth, because everybody seems to have <laughs> some sort of story right. about a great flood. Yeah. When the great flood came, humanity, mm -hmm. us, climbed on the turtle's back until the waters receded. And when the waters went down, uh, then he dumped that's us all. Cool. Yeah, he dumped us all off, and here that's we are neat. today. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Yeah, it's really great. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Anyway, that's if we can head hmm. back, but okay. I just wanted to remind everyone that all of these gorgeous, incredible pieces are here for sale, just like they would be if we were up on the plaza. But unfortunately, we can't be uh, this year. But probably next year, that'll be that'll be great fun again. When uh, not only can we appreciate all the beauty that we see from the uh, the work of all the Native American artists, but you know, it's nice for them because they get you know there's some people that they're friends with, and the only time they get to see them is at Indian Market when they can. Uh, renew their uh, um, their friendship and and uh, catch up on on old times. Well, I'm going to head back and talk to Rebecca and, and Amanda a little more. Miss Rebecca, <laughs> are you awake? <right? laughs> To the people who purchase them the way they've brought joy to our to our our lives and that we part in good standing with one another what a lovely thought what so, a lovely thought so you, you you literally say goodbye to the the pieces and uh, send them on their way mm -hmm. well we try to find good homes for them here too <laughs> yeah, absolutely <laughs>
So that's that's one thing that you know my grandmother always told us. You don't just sell them, and you know, um, yes, we make money from them, but um, we always wish them well that they bring someone else joy and happiness. In well, their, in and their homes. well, the pots are doing something for you too, mm -hmm. because they you turn them into cash, and then that cash um, lets you have the things you need and the things that you want on top of that. How many pots do you make a year, do you think? <laughs> I don't know. That's one thing I've been asked and I have no idea. Um, I think I'll start keeping track of how many pieces I make and how many, how many pieces make it through the firing and how, how many pots. <laughs> um, some, I, I will keep some of my pots. I've mm -hmm. given, um, I think, a plate to my brother and my niece, my sister, but uh, and my nephew. But not. now, do you have any at home? Mm, Are there any that yes. you, that you can bear to get rid of? Uh, oh, I have some most of my pieces, but I have um, most of my pieces have been um, brought here or purchased during market or the herd show, but. Um, it was always hard for me to part with them, so I never really took pictures. Um, <laughs> um, and I just lately I've been yeah. taking pictures. Yeah. Um, so well, if you never, of, ever need to visit your old friends, over the last 27 years, I've been taking pictures. Oh. And uh, little by little, we are donating all of them to the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture here. We're right up to about, we're over 25,000 pictures that we have uh, donated to them. And before they, you know, were doing digital cameras, we took them with a regular camera, or I took them with a regular camera. And on the back of each one of those photographs, it didn't matter where I was going, I always had a pack of photographs. In, in my purse so that if there was an extra five or ten minutes somewhere, I could write on the back. And on the back of each one is the name of the artist and the Pueblo that they come from and the measurements of the pot, a little description of the pot, when, it's, oh, when it was made, when it was sold, and how much it sold for. Mm. And then, you know, I put them in a shoebox. <laughs> and then one shoe box grew into two shoe boxes, and then into five, and then into 20. And by the time it was time to start digitizing these photographs, there were about oh, maybe oh, close to 30 bo shoe boxes packed mm -hmm. in tight of standing up photographs. And I started putting them together by Pueblo. Mm -hmm. And then Pueblos grew into individual people. But I wow. remember when that first batch went to um, the, the Museum of, uh, well, they're up at the Laboratory of Anthropology, and it's part of the New Mexico State Museums. And when they were up at the, when they were up at the, the museum, that I remember maybe, there were oh, probably a good, a good six inches of packed photographs of your pieces. So if you ever want to go visit old friends, give me a call and I'll give you a, the number for the librarian up there and you can go and see some of your old uh, pieces that, that are up there. But yeah, um, we were thinking that it would be a really, really wonderful thing for the museum to have because, you know, there are lots of people who do research and write books and do all those kinds of things. And for example, they could see at least, at least a hundred examples of your pieces of pottery and uh, see how your designs change, see how your prices <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> change, uh, see how the sizes change. So would you just uh, keep telling me about the design that you got going over here, Amanda? <laughs> and so you're just crossing over the, the other X's? Yeah, basically. I can't believe this, Rebecca. I'm what? 
This is really unbelievable. Yeah, I'm just going to yeah. One of our clients was so moved by your reaction that he purchased this pot for you as a gift. And now, here's a, pic here's a piece by your mama. All yours. Oh. Uh, well, mama, grandma, same person. Really? Yeah. Uh-huh. But I don't have a name. No, he doesn't want to be identified. He doesn't want to be identified. Why? <laughs> well, kind things. Oh, I'm so happy for you. Yay. Oh, thank you. I can't say thank you enough. That's real, really special. Because this is going to go to my daughter, Amanda, and her daughter. She's the only granddaughter I have. So my other two daughters don't have any children. Amanda's daughter is my only granddaughter. Well, there's no question quite here. How, how lovely. What a, what a wonderful, kind, generous thing to do. And I don't know who this person is, but uh, there's certainly an extra star in your crown in heaven, that's for sure. Because I think, I think those are tears of joy, Rebecca. Yes, I know. That vase that I sent was my grandmother's. That's what I was going to give to my granddaughter. Well, now she is too. Yes, Amanda never knew my grandmother. She's just seen pictures of her, and uh, I think my grandmother passed away in, um, she passed away in, uh, 91, 90 or 91. 91? Yes, and, um, so, uh, that was the only part I had of my grandmother, grandmother's honor. Wow. But. Oh, isn't this wonderful? This well, is, you are so special. Oh, it's so special, is right. I I don't know who this uh, gift well, giver is, but it, you know, you you've got a, a lifelong friend both ways. Well, thank you to whoever did this. Oh, really appreciate it, and I hope that you get it back ten times more. I want to know who it is, even though they don't want to know who it is, and show my appreciation and how, because it means that much to me. When this plate is finished, it will go to the person who did that for me. Oh. Oh. Wow. Wow. I, well, I guess whoever did that is listening, and I just, wow. All I can say that this is just absolutely incredible. Would you like me? Oh, you can hug it for a little while. <laughs> while you're here. Please hug it. Okay. Yeah, we'll put it over there so you can, you know, what, get, put it here, Jerry. <laughs> that was honey. One of the gallery dogs, and there must be some little yucky chihuahua out there giving her the eye. And uh, that way, you know, she has to make let the world know that this is her gallery <laughs> and that no other dogs are allowed. Well, it makes it a little hard to move on now, doesn't it? Yeah. After <laughs> such a generous and wonderful gift. Oh, well, I never well, I would have come across anything. Now from yeah. um, Marilyn Ray saying, my family and I are overwhelmed with emotion, knowing our grandmother's piece is coming home. We can't thank you enough for your generosity. My grandma was real special to all of us. Uh -huh. Marilyn grew up. During the summer months, that's where Marilyn and my sister Diane spent their summer months, and she was the she was my greatest inspiration. Um, 
and I really missed her dearly. And I was, I always feel so blessed and so thankful that she raised me as her own daughter and allowed me to call her mom. And when she passed away, I still had a mom, my own mom, my biological mom. And it was really hurtful and painful because my mom died during our religious ceremonies when all of us, majority of us weren't there when my mom passed. It was just two of my sisters that were there when my, two or three of my sisters that were there when my mom passed because we were all at Akuma taking part in some religious activities so none of us knew that my, my mom had passed. But um, this is really special. I'll never forget this day. And I thank the person who who did this for us. I'm sure he's, he'll want to be known, but he just doesn't want to be known on air. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, this is his. I said when I finish it, I'll bring it back up and you can give it to that person. Well, we will keep in touch, that's for mm -hmm. sure. Absolutely. And put you in touch if that works for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, how, how do we go on from there? I don't know now. I can't see. I know my eyes. <laughs> yeah. Let's see if I can put it in a little bit. Well, just remember there are really good people in this world. There are, there are a lot of really nice, special people in our world. And that's what I try to focus on when you see and hear of all these things that are going on in the, in the world everywhere. And that's what we always focus back on is our pottery to take away that, that, um, the pain and just kind of get away, get, get away from all the stuff that's going on out there. This is what brings us joy, and I guess that's why I really always came back to my pottery, and that's what I do. That's where I'm always at is my uh, is my little studio where I work with my pottery. That's where I'm at. As soon as I'm finished breakfast, that's where I go, and that's where anybody can find me, and I let the people know in the in the at the, at the Pueblo, I tell them, if you're looking for me, I'm at my shop. If I'm not at my shop, then I'm at Guante Town or something, but that's where I spent my days every day. And my granddaughter comes over, and Amanda will take pictures of her being over there. She always tells me, Grandma, I want to paint. So I give her the ceramic paint and some um, um, the slip cast turtles and stuff, and that's what she paints so that she doesn't get into my clay and my paint. So she all, always has something to do. But she knows that, you know, that she's not to touch my, my paints. Well, we heard from Dan again, Dan in San Diego. And guess what he said? What? Dragonflies are insects too. Ah. And, uh, Car Carolyn at one time wrote us a little, um, about what all the various yeah. symbols are. Maryland has one too. You'll get more from Maryland. Plus more? They, they do more of that than we do. I don't do too many of that. And so. Yeah, and he also asked whether um, whether Amanda does insects in her designs. And no. She's, she's so, no. she said, quite frankly, she couldn't draw a fish. Yeah. <laughs> the outline that, of the fish. That's not, that's not the true. Really true. <laughs> I always tell her, I tell her, you should paint some members or put a member's design in them. I don't want to. They look terrible, she tells me. In Maryland, that's why she does storytellers. That's her thing. She tried making jars and plates and everything. She said, I can't do it. I don't know how you make them, so I'll stick to my storytellers. So that, well, that, you know, Helen Cordero, who is credited with making the first storyteller uh, from Cochiti Pueblo, 
And she was this dear, sweet, little old lady, so wonderful, I couldn't believe it. And one day, um, I asked her why she made storytellers, and her response was, because I don't make pottery so good. <laughs> and that so, would be Marilyn's. Yeah, yeah. That, that was uh, Helen's, uh, who you know, started the whole storyteller thing uh, mm -hmm. in the 1960s. And, the, and, I, and I've seen a few of the pots that Helen made, and she was absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> Makes the pottery so when good. Marilyn first started making storytellers, she was so proud because she got into Indian Market and she had 50 storytellers and she was selling them for 50 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> and she sold out the first day. She was really proud. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, they're not 50 bucks anymore. <laughs> but I found this little piece of paper that, uh, that Carolyn, your other sister, gave us. And mm -hmm. she said, the butterfly equals beauty. The dragonfly is the messenger. The turtle is longevity. Mm -hmm. The hummingbird is prosperity. Uh, the ladybug is good luck. Mm -hmm. The fish is faith. The rabbit is abundance. The lizard is curiosity. And the cocopelli is fertility. So I guess that just explains everything, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I guess so. Wow. Mm -hmm. And talk about lizards and curiosity. For some reason mm -hmm. this year, I don't know if it's true where you are, there is just this enormous population of lizards. There yeah. must be a lot of bugs too. Yes. But I, I, have have to, yeah, I don't have a lot of bugs because there are a lot of lizards. And um, Mila, Amanda's daughter, she just knows them in, in uh, Karis. She'll run around and she'll grab my grab my grab my grab my grab my Mayo, Mayo, Mayo. Mayo means lizard and she'll be chasing them. But we have a lot. We have a lot of lizards this year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, Derek's long haired dog, Honey, likes to chase the lizards. So <laughs> she goes crazy over the lizards. Has she ever caught one? No, no. <laughs> and will she ever be able to catch one? <laughs> Very no. much no, also. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, I know that Mr. Al is around and he wanted to say a few words to Rebecca and Amanda and, and to talk to uh, them. So I'm going to give up my seat for, oh, 15 minutes or so, and you can have a slightly different perspective on life when it all is. Yeah. And, and I wish you luck and I hope you survive. Uh, but I know that he would like to talk to you for a, a few minutes. Okay. And uh, Al Miller works here. He's worked here for a long time. And, and I know many of our customers and any potters that might be watching uh, know Al Miller very well. And so he's going to take over my chair for a few minutes. And, and I'm going to make him promise not to give you too bad of a time, okay? Okay. okay. <laughs> come on, Al, come sit down. Well, first of all, I have to say I'm just totally blown away by that act of kindness. And as that was happening, we had another guy on the line who fell in love with your mother's piece and was inquiring about it. So I think you should call him up and say, sorry, sir, <laughs> it's mine. <laughs> I'm just saying. But he wants, he wants us to notify him the next time one of your mother's pieces comes in because he was really attracted to mm -hmm. it. Wow, you what know, a story. I've never seen another one of, in 27 years in business. Mm -hmm. I don't think we've had another one of your mother's pieces. This is the first one that came in this week. I okay. can't believe and that. I'm Just the timing. Yeah. Yes, yeah, the, the timing. Well, is time really... is everything, isn't it? Yeah. So, uh, what a way, huh? To mm -hmm. end your day up here. And yeah. uh, it's been a treat having you here. Of course, I couldn't be out here watching like I'd like to. But <laughs> anyway, people are responding in such a negative, a positive way about what they're seeing here. And 
It's, we're so lucky that you people will take the time, you artists, and come in and spend a, a day with us mm -hmm. and show your secrets. So many secrets you, you've been giving us, and it's so easy to work with customers with your work. It's the finest fine line around, and it's just the most beautiful pottery. Thank you. So I'm honored. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, I really am proud of my son and my daughter for following in my footsteps. And I just, you know, um, I just keep encouraging them and telling them that that I'm proud that they're they're taking that interest because um, not too many uh, young people, um, you know, with all the the famous potters, their children or their grandchildren are not um, carrying on the tradition. It's so sad, and isn't it? Yes. It's and a it's, gift from the, yes. the special mm -hmm. beings. And yes. You don't know how lucky you are to have two children that are taking it up, mm -hmm. and both of them are staying in your tradition, mm -hmm. but with a slight twist. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, you're very, to me, I think you're very blessed. I, hard I feel that blessed. way, yes, and they realize that, that it is time consuming and um, it, it can be, um, it can be get discouraging at times because uh, uh, I just keep telling them, just do your own thing, don't try, I try to say, I'm going to paint like mom, um, that's your, your design, your pattern, that's who you are. You're putting yourself, a part of yourself, into those pots. Oh, it's it's a so, gift. So um, it's it's something that that um, I treasure, um, not just my pots, but my children. And I'm hoping that my granddaughter. I was already telling Amanda, I want to teach my granddaughter, you know, how to make pottery. Start with um, the coils, right? Yes. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. So I I want to teach her and. Uh, uh, I'm hoping that, you know, at least my other grandchildren um, will um, follow as well. They're, they, they haven't really taken too much interest or um, anything in the pottery making, but um, they're good housekeepers. They All I got for to me. say is, I hope Derek and Andrea <laughs> see the first pot that your granddaughter makes. I hope it comes yeah. up here for mm -hmm. them to enjoy it. It's yeah. so exciting when a child will bring a pot into here, yes. and it's mm -hmm. it's so exciting. Mm -hmm. That's now, there's been a lot watching. of interest on Amanda's new piece. It's I call it the corn maidens. I'm sure they're not. Oh, yeah. And then the, the, the four circles. Yeah. And to me, they read like little eagle feathers. Yeah. That piece was just so whimsical. Uh -huh. It's so well laid out and so beautifully done. Mm -hmm. Not a wobble in the strokes and oh it was gorgeous so thank you you're both doing wonderful work thank you i just love my job i don't know if i told you <laughs> i get to meet all, all these wonderful artists and uh -huh. to me it's been an honor just and you have so many gifts that's what i so enjoy. tell me something that you didn't tell andrea that what? someone like me would really like to know about what's, what's going on a secret, a secret. <laughs> Wow. Secret. Oh, secret. Which one? <laughs> Which secret? <laughs> I don't know in general. I mean, you know. It's not a secret anymore. Oh. Yeah. Well, I was hoping. Well, you... if, if Victoria's secrets can have secrets, Rebecca Lucario can have secrets. <laughs> <laughs> See? That's what I want to hear. And the other thing that's so interesting, the whole family, I mean, mm -hmm. the sisters, I mean, yes. oh my gosh, your, your parents must have been so proud. I mean, you all took oh, up the clay yes. and not only did that, but you passed mm -hmm. it on. Yes, I would have made pottery, but um, not to, um, it was just something she didn't do from the beginning, and she's not the one that taught us how to do pottery. It was uh, mostly uh, our grandmother. Mm -hmm. Dolores who did that and like I said we spent summers with her and I was just really pleased that all my sisters every single one of us make pottery oh, yeah. you know there's five of us sisters and we just all encourage one another and sometimes we share some of our our paints our materials mm -hmm. we go get clay together or if one of us has uh, a white slip then we share or we come up with a different color we share that 
And that's usually what I give to Marilyn is, you know, she's the one that lives just down the road. So I go down there and I'll tell her, we came across this paint, you know, you can try it because you're the one that uses all these colors. It's in amazing, your isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. And I've told Amanda, when you just dig up some clay, some paints, you find them, then uh, take a picture of it with your, your camera or just use that fire the piece, see what, if you like the, the, what it comes out, the color that it comes out after the fire, then if you want to continue to use that, you know where to get it. Because if you get too many, it's like, then you say, I don't know where I got this. So you have to, you have to you document know? yourself, yes. don't you? Mm -hmm. Yes. That, that'd be hard for me. Yes. And no. for me, it was well, hard, so. You know what would kill me? Going out to the clay vein. I'd probably be way back Getting the clay. Oh, that would that would just put me that away. That was the terrifying part for me because I was like snakes. claustrophobic <laughs> and I like you're yeah. under this huge slab of rock and I'm like, oh my gosh, please don't fall. <laughs> See, I've heard of things yeah, like that. It's scary. So when you're out digging the clay, how much? I mean, five gallon buckets is that what we use? And yes. Uh -huh. How many do you bring back enough to last a season? Or? Um, yes. Sometimes we uh, like this last time we went, um, Marilyn and her daughter and my nephew. And um, we went out there, and it was like two years ago. I think it was about two years ago that we went out there to get some. And um, of course, Marilyn's daughter only got, you know, some in her backpack, and she said, "That's enough for me." And yeah, because okay. it's 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 a long ways to walk, and you can't drive up there. No, no, no. You just drive to the base of the mesa, and then you walk. There's just a footpath to get the clay and it's quite a ways. And then when you have to carry a back, that kind of, you know, it's carrying, like carrying mm -hmm. a big old rock, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it, it usually takes six to seven hours just to do that. Mm -hmm. So do you do a couple trips that day back and forth or mm -hmm. yeah. just try to carry out enough? Yes, it, it, maybe about six, six trips back and forth because you can only carry a little at a time. It's oh heavy because it's whole, still damp. Right, and then mm -hmm. the whole purifying yes. the clay right. and everything like that. Mm -hmm. What I loved watching when um, Derek and Andrea handed you this piece, mm -hmm. you went right into the so inside of it. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that so many times with potters when they're looking at a, mm -hmm. a piece that came from their family down the road. It, it's talking to you, isn't it? It's life, it represents mm -hmm. life. And I love it when I see it. It was just so beautiful and I hope it was beautiful when that happened. Mm -hmm. So, isn't it horrible? No Indian market. I mean, it's not only the market, it's the socialization. Yes. Bringing together everybody, yes. yeah. seeing what everybody's doing. Wow. I guess I felt the same way my sister did, Marilyn. When I heard there was no market, I cried. Marilyn <laughs> cried. <laughs> we all cried because we, to us, yes, it's a place to come. But the thing that really always that we look forward to is coming and seeing our friends, getting get to, uh, you know, make new friends and see new artists. That to me is market, uh -huh. not just selling our pieces and stuff, but it's, it's the people. Um, and how sharing. many years has it been for you? Ah, oh, gosh, when did I you got start into out? Indian market when, um, Lucy Loudon was, um, she's the one that helped me get in a long time ago. That was like in maybe 1970, 74, 75. Oh my gosh. And, we, and I was coming before that. We used to sit up on the other side of the portal, my grandmother and I. We weren't part of market, but they allowed us to sit out there and that's where we used to sit. And were you able to sell then? Yes, we were oh, still so able to fun. sell. And then when um, I asked around, I tried to inquire about how you get into market, who I who the contact people were, or how I, you know, applications or whatever was necessary to get into to, to market. And, and then um, I had to bring a piece up and show my piece and everything. And uh, they told me that they, um, I could, if there was an artist that I knew that I could, I, my, my chances of getting into market would be better if I could share a booth with someone. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I started out. I even shared a booth with Rachel Concha one time. Really? Yes. And um, so that's how I got in. And finally we got our own booth and then we all shared a booth. 
Marilyn, Judy, and, and I, we all shared a booth. Now, I'm just going to say something. It's always special when your family comes in here. There's a certain amount of joy and everything, you know, camaraderie and everything when you, when you <laughs> girls come in. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, that first couple of years when you're all sharing a booth, now that must have been fun. <laughs> I'm just we had a blast. <laughs> uh -huh. Yes, we had a listening. Um, and that's one thing that um, I treasure a lot because my sisters and I get along really, really well. We're very close, even with our brothers. And I miss the family gatherings. Uh, there was a time when we ate together as a family with all our children, grandchildren. Um, back, you know, 10 years ago, um, we used to do it every weekend. Isn't that wonderful? Every weekend we shared a meal together. Oh. And our kids were still young. We, um, and I miss the family gatherings. We played volleyball in the backyard. And, or we played baseball or you know, whatever we could, we, we just played with the kids. We'd go out, picnic, uh, do picnics up in the mountains and just go out there and gather together with everyone, like Easter, Christmas, any holiday that came around, birthdays, we were all there. You're so lucky. And, and it was, um, and I miss that. I miss that a lot because um, it's it's nice to have um, family around mm -hmm. all the time, and I it hurts me when I see other families, even with our own relatives. Some of the the siblings don't get along, and um, I I just feel blessed and really feel good that my brothers and my sisters. You know, we now, all did get your along. brother pot? What did he ever do pots? Who your brother? No. No, but Bernard no. did. Bernard did when he was still married to my um, ex sister in law Sharon. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then um, Daniel, he does beautiful pieces too. I mean, he's very slow at painting and making and everything, <laughs> but he does still make. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and but he's the one that grinds all my clay. He'll come up and get the clay that's already soaked. He'll take it down, grind it, and uh, he'll bring it back up where he sift it. So I, I, I use the clay. And that's when it's really powdery fine. Yes, yes. And then uh, Bryant has, um, I gave Marilyn some clay because she said she ran out of clay. But, of course, they sent half of it back. They ground, uh, Bryant ground up the clay and brought half of it back to me. But I told him <laughs> that he didn't have to do that. It was all for them. Because um, it, with Marilyn, she doesn't have any scrapings. She hardly has any. She uses all the clay because of her storyteller figures. No, I heard you, lesson. overheard you as I was walking through once, talking about a can lid. What, what, were, you, oh. were you talking about oh. something that I remember? Oh, myself? the most expensive two that I own? A million dollars. Oh, right here. Cost me ten thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, you probably made that on that can lid. Yeah, I use this to scrape the, the clay off of the um to thin the pots down. It's chewing to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's chewing so to that. So if you find any of these, yeah, I'm gonna look for one for yeah. you. Yeah, make sure you. You know, them I them. had one once like that, but it wasn't. Tin. It was sterling silver set with turquoise. I suppose some cow, some artist made it for a snooze okay. can for a lid for some uppity cowboy. Anyway, wow. this has been an honor. What a treat. Yes. And like I said, very it's so special. exciting when you and your family come into the gallery and I've been blessed by meeting you. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Rebecca, Andrew, do you want to yeah, 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 I have a message here for Rebecca. Um, it's from Franklin Peters, who was one of Aww. your tribal members, yes. and he says, Hello everyone at the gallery. It's me, Franklin Peters. Rebecca, I started to cry when you saw your mom's pottery. I wish I could find some of my grandma's pottery, Rosalie Vala. And happy you can actually hold and feel her again. I have one of Mary Histia's, and I hold the pottery a lot to feel the amazing energy. Thank you a bunch for helping me with the paint. Thank you. Today, uh, it wasn't a pottery making day, but seeing you all do pottery, I've made four pieces today. Thank you for the inspiration. <laughs> Doea, which means thank you. Yes.
and, and curious. Anyway, uh, I thought I would pass that message on. And we had asked Franklin to come and do a demonstration too, but he said that he was he was fearful that the, the Pueblo would be completely shut down and he wouldn't be able to come and so he passed. But Franklin, we're going to see you here in October and we're going to spend the day with you and we're going to get you to tell all your stories and all your secrets too. <laughs> and uh, we really look forward to doing that. But I thought you might like this nice message. From Thank here. you so much. Thank you, Franklin. If you're still listening, um, I just want to continue to encourage you. You you also have come a long way. I've seen you grow, and you're still welcome to come ask me questions. You know, I always share what you need to know. I'm willing to share and teach whoever wants to learn. You're always welcome. My door is always welcome to, to anybody that wants to learn. And, and if anyone out there isn't familiar with Franklin's beautiful work, uh, all you need to do is go to our website and then go to artists and then um, check the, the click on the little box for P for Peters and look at Franklin's uh, pieces. Franklin does some really, really gorgeous, gorgeous water jars. Yes. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, we're going to pretty much wind it down, but I wanted to just say a few things before I thank the two of you. Uh, this series will continue. Uh, we have six down and 14 more to go. <laughs> five, five days a week for the entire month of August. Nice. And coming up in the next two days is Pottery tomorrow by Wilma Bacatosa from uh, Jemez Pueblo. And if you could grab that. Am I on a camera? Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> uh, I guess I better start scratching my nose then. But the, these beautiful pieces made by Wilma uh, Bacatosa. And uh, she does something called scrafito, which is an Italian word. It means to scratch. And so what she does is she coils the pot, she um, sands the pot, she puts slip on the pot, she polishes the pot, she fires the pot. And then after the firing is over, with a tool, some people use a dental tool, the discarded ones that your dentists don't want anymore, <laughs> uh, or a pen knife, uh, or an exacto knife, and they scrape away the red, the slip that's on the top of the pot. So the the red is the polished surface of the pot, and this cream color is what is underneath that red slip. So you'll get to see her tomorrow uh, with this great scrafito. And then on Thursday we have. Sandra Victorino, and Sandra is from Acoma Pueblo also, but if you notice, a very, very different style. Same materials, same process, same rocks, uh, same as um, uh, Sandra, and, uh, excuse me, same as Rebecca, but a completely different style of painting. And Sandra will be here with her son, Cletus. So today we have mother and daughter, and tomorrow we have mother and son, which is really great. And then, Friday, Friday? Friday, Friday. Friday is our featured artist for this um, Indian market that should have been. Uh, his name is Richard Zane Smith. He is Wyandotte. And the Wyandotte tribe is in the northeast corner of Oklahoma. Apparently, Richard has some health issues, and we have a rule that's been set in place by our governor that if you are coming in from out of state, you must self-quarantine for two weeks. And that combination has led Richard to decide that he is not going to come in person, but we're going to do a Zoom with his 
uh, work, and he's going to not only demonstrate pottery making, but he's going to tell you about his Wyandotte language, because he is the person that is reviving the Wyandotte language uh, in his, on his reservation. And he will also sing some of the songs in his uh, language, which are really, really very interesting. But what's so amazing about Richard's work is the fact that every single line that you will see in these pots is an individual coil. His coils are finer than the spaghetti that you eat for dinner. <laughs> and how, what he does with those um, coils and how he manipulates them and how he builds them we have several large pots of his that probably have 500 coils stacked on top of each other. They're truly, truly, unbelievably amazing. And then what he does is he stains the pots so that um, you, that's how he achieves the coloration. And he uses a lot of natural pigments for stain as well. And superimposes sometimes the designs on top of these uh, these pieces. Another thing he does is that he collects the exposed roots by the river where he lives and those exposed roots he polishes and then uses them as handles on his pieces of pottery. They're really, really magnificent. Anyway, he will be here via Zoom, and somehow we'll figure it all out. <laughs> oh well. Uh, anyway, that's what's coming up, and uh, all I know is the person who's having the most fun doing this is me, and it's been a, a, a real joy, especially to have you two ladies here. And like I've said before, I've known Rebecca since the dinosaurs were on the earth, and I knew Amanda when she was just a, you know, a, a punk kid. And now she has a, a, a child of her own, which is really quite wonderful. So I get to see the very next generation of pottery makers. And Rebecca and Amanda, I can't thank you enough. You're a joy, you're a delight, you're a source of information. You are an incredible twosome, and I am so jealous that you have each other because I would like to make it a, you know, a triumvirate where there could be three of us. But <laughs> thank you again and again for sharing not only your, your incredible talent, but all of your history and your culture and um, the exquisite product uh, that, it, that all these things call for. Thank you, thank you so much. You're welcome. And I wanna say thank you for always helping me out. You're always there. Um, I've known you for a long time. And um, you know, you probably know all my secrets, so let's not tell everybody our secrets. Oh, <laughs> what, what happens at Andrea Fisher Fine Pottery stays yes, at Andrea yes. Fisher Fine Pottery. We'll call this Except Andrea's in Las Vegas. <laughs> but you know, I can be bribed. <laughs> I can be bribed. Um, I can always um, lean on your shoulder. You've been there for me. In good times and in bad, and that really means a lot to me. But thank you, thank you for giving us this opportunity to share what we do with our world. Thank and, you, and a special thank you to that anonymous person yes. whose generosity has really made the day, the yes. month, the year yes. for all of us. Thank yes. you, thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.